Welcome to Down to Herf, the podcast for cigar smokers, whiskey drinkers, and for the people just looking to kick back, light up, and have a good time. I'm your host, Jerry, and I'm joined by, as always, my co-host, Gio and Caleb. Fellas, fellas, fellas. Boys, we are back from a little hiatus. We took a little week off. God, did we need it. Oh, yeah. What do you think, G? I don't know. The cigar that we are not going to talk about quite yet has had me a little melted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I am... Oh, I am definitely in agreement to that. Uh, Caleb, how you doing, bro? I'm cooked, bro. I'm cooked. But uh, what's cracking, guys? Good to be back after a little hiatus, but uh, we're we're still cooking up in the garage. Uh, obviously, Gio mentions this at the end of the episode. Uh, boys, congratulations on two years. Uh, obviously, this isn't like a two year celebration or anything. Uh, I feel like we're a little beyond that now. Just celebrating little milestones like that, but uh. Listen, fellas, we we have a lot to get into today, and you know, uh, there's a lot to a lot to celebrate. You know, yeah, definitely. I mean, before we get into anything, got to give our usual uh, shout out to our sponsor, Crown Heads, John Huber, and Mike Condor, Miguel. You guys are always appreciated, putting out great products. Coronada is out now. You've got. A ton of stuff fresh off PCA. We appreciate you as always. Looking forward to what you got in the future for 2024. Make sure you guys are checking out Crown Heads. They're putting out a lot of bangers, a lot of great stuff. Yeah. We appreciate them. Um, that being said, we uh we smoked a really, really, really good cigar pre-released. Smoked it with the man who blended it himself. Uh, we drank a great bottle of whiskey tonight. Uh. A lot to get to, man. A lot to get to. Gio, before we, you know, get too off topic, man, you want to talk about kind of what we smoked? So, guys, today we actually will probably be the first ones to have smoked this by a uh, long shot here. Uh, special thanks to our buddy Alex from Roma Craft to Back for hooking us up with this at the show. We are smoking the limited edition Clovis from Roma Craft with the new blend fresh off the reimagined black irish so the clovis is a uh the new version of the black irish with the new blend obviously with the switch from connecticut to pennsylvania broadleaf these cigars they are limited to 500 boxes of 24 they're slated supposedly to release by the end of april uh hopefully they get to you guys soon obviously this is a little bit early for it but We'll get into the nuts and bolts. This cigar is a 5x56. It's the EMH sizing that Roma Craft likes to do. It is a barber pull with Ecuadorian Candela tobacco over that nice Pennsylvania broadleaf. Uh, the Sumatra hybrid binder is what they got going on. And then it's got fillers from the Dominican Republic and Nicaragua. MSRP is going to be set at 1315 a stick. Perfect, man. Uh, dude, this was... Uh, Ooh-wee. If yeah. You, for those who are big fans of Roma Craft, this is going to do exactly what you think it's going to do. Absolutely. It's going to melt you in your fucking chair. It's amazing. Caleb. Yeah. Speaking of melted. Speaking of melted. Yeah, I'm melting in this chair kind of like all the chocolate that I've been eating because I need to <laughs> refine my pal- palate to get ready for the next cigar. But what we paired that Clovis with today, we got a new one. We got Savage and Cook. Now, this is a cask-finished bourbon whiskey, uh, finished in a Cabernet Sauvignon barrel uh, out of California. So this is all from California. Uh, it's made by uh, Dave Finney and uh, whiskey distiller uh, Jordan Villa. So Dave makes the wine out in California, and the distiller of the whiskey is Jordan. So they do this all on their wine property. They have three different warehouses where they age the barrels and everything like that. This is a 100-proofer. Got a nice cab finish on there. Uh, you know what? I gotta say, I melted from the cigar, so I didn't really drink a lot of this bourbon. Maybe had two two pours. I I don't know if the pairing yeah, worked out for me too. Well. I, I always hate when Caleb doesn't drink because I see the true damage I can do on a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> uh, I call Caleb over in the middle of an episode. I kind of give him like a, and then he brings me over the bottle, 
And then it sits on my desk while I operate everything. And then I'm like, holy shit, I just drank like five pours of this. <laughs> yeah, and if you then, ever wonder why the cameras don't switch for a little bit longer, that's because Jerry had a little too much whiskey that episode. <laughs> I mean, hey, it is what it is, man. I, I'm just I mean, kidding, We're buddy. celebrating we... two years. Yeah. <laughs> so all the grain for this bottle is grown within 50 miles of the, of the distillery and winery. Uh, direct relationship with the farmers and everyone there. Uh, you got yellow corn. Is the bulk of this recipe about seventy five percent? Then rye and malted barley as well, um, all distilled, milled, mashed on site too. So all out of California. Uh, five batches of distillate are blended at a time for consistency prior to barreling. Uh, the barrels come from White American Oak Char Number no. Three barrels, uh, handcrafted by a local uh, local person on site as well. Uh, bourbon is aged for a minimum of three years, although. It's often aged longer. They say minimum three. They don't put the exact age on here. Uh, all, like I, Again, like I said, all aging is done on site in the rick houses that they have over there in California. Uh, then they're finished in the Cabernet barrels for a period of, of one to two months, which add additional flavors, textures, and character. Uh, all the water for this is also distorsed, d- dis- sourced. The fuck did you just say? Dude, I'm so melted right now. I'm he, not drunk. I'm just He melted. got clovis <laughs> I did get clovis It's hitting me now. Um, so the water comes from a uh, high mountain elevation on Dave's property in Alexander Valley, not far from the distillery. Uh, mash bill, 75% corn, 21% rye, 4% malted barley here. So that's what we drank today. Uh, as the guy who drank most of that bottle, I can say it's pretty fucking good. Yeah, that cab finish was nice. Yeah, it's not bad. Went nice with, uh, with the cigar we had. <laughs> that cigar stood up to it, that's for sure. Yeah, man, no doubt. Uh... <laughs> That being said, you want to kind of just jump right into it? All right, guys. Without further ado, we got Skip Martin from Romacraft back coming right at you. All right. We are here with co-founder of Romacraft to back, Skip Martin. Skip, how you doing, brother? It's been a while since you've been on. Doing good, man. You guys took me off my Xbox uh, <laughs> live session for this. So just hope we didn't ruin the kill streak. Yeah, well, you're you know, just, you're still dropping in with the boys. Yeah. <laughs> Pawn and noobs. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I hate about those uh, lobby skip that like twelve year olds tell me they're gonna fuck my mom. Oh, dude, all the time. They not, fucking not... It, it actually like hurts me a little bit. I'm <laughs> I'm 34 years old. I just want to sit around. I want to play video games and I want to like exactly. just enjoy and like take the stresses of life and kind of forget about them for an hour or two. And then I have a twelve year old tell me he's gonna fuck my mom. But that's what you it were upsets doing. Me. That's what you were doing back in the day though. So it yeah, all comes full circle. But, but yeah. I grew up in the OG generation of it. I think now if you say shit like that on Xbox Live, they like will ban you and I've gotten you warnings. I, I got an eighteen day suspension. Oh, unreal. Damn. What's happening in this? I don't world? even know what I said. I'm sure it was awesome. Yeah. They don't let you listen to it. The ori- the original <laughs> Xbox Live lobbies with like Halo and all that. Some of the most atrocious things were said in those lobbies. <laughs> but. Dude, I was playing back in the, what, what was it, Leroy Johnson? You know what I'm talking about? Leroy Jenkins, I think, yeah. Leroy Jenkins, Was that yeah. War, War of Warcraft, right? Uh, dude, I was playing before. I, I remember on my submarine in, in 93 playing Castle Wolfenstein 3D. <laughs> nice. I don't even know what the hell that is. It was like a land parties. It was like <laughs> it was, a yeah. World War Two game, right, or something like that. It was like it was like before. Uh, it was like the predecessor to Doom. Oh. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say. Yeah. I remember. I was a Resident Evil kid. Yeah, same. Castle Wolfenstein 3D. It, it was not high tech, <laughs> but it was dope. It was the first. I think it was the first first person shooter before Goldeneye. Oh yeah, and you were playing yeah. that on a sub. Um, yeah, I was uh, on the submarine on a computer on the because uh, nothing was connected to the internet. Then it was all, you know. Oh, well, that's pretty badass on the floppy analog. Desk, huh? yeah. It was all analog. Yeah. I thought all they had back in those days was centipede or <laughs> what's, what's that other one? Snake. No, what's that? One? What's the one that's like Pong. no one understands it? <sighs> My, uh, it's like Mind snake kind of. Yeah, Minesweeper. Uh, I don't understand that game either. That was definitely I know, when I when I was. I mean, I remember. Shoot, when I was a kid, my first game system was Pong, believe it or not. Uh, mm. I don't think we owned it. I think someone in the trailer park owned it or whatever. And then uh, uh, I th- we got an Atari 2600. Then, uh, um, of course, we were always like two two platforms behind 
you know, so when everyone else was getting the Atari 5200 or the, the Intellivision or whatever, that's when we got the 2600. If you were always uh, one from, behind. From, from the pawn shop. He had Gamecast. Yeah. Gamecast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, game Dreamcast or whatever. Yeah, Gamecast. That was way down the road. <laughs> What's that movie's Mal- uh, Malibu's Malibu's Most Wanted? Wanted? He's like, well, no, there's, Dream, there's Dreamcast and GameCube. I got Gamecast. I can't afford it. <laughs> yeah. No, I was in boot camp when um, when Super NES came out. Or, uh, Super, Super Nintendo. Nintendo. Oh, yeah. And uh, they had the uh, Fox something. And Star Fox. Like the Star Fox, flight, yeah. Flight, like the... the where you're like simulator. skydiving through the circles and stuff. Yeah, that was actually a really fun game. I remember that. Yeah, I, was, I was in boot camp at that point. Yeah. There were, there were, when video games were simpler, I feel like they were like sometimes just completely more fun. Like Crash Bandicoot. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Play it for hours. Or Ace Squad, I should say, not boot camp. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, GoldenEye was dope. GoldenEye mm. was uh, in the, the Tomb Raider. Tomb Raider, Laura, yeah. Laura Pix- Croft, oh. pixelated double Ds. Yeah, man. <laughs> I mean, when you compare that to like Pitfall, nice. Pitfall was basically the same five screens going left to right for for yeah. a year. You know what I mean? But uh, yeah, I'm old. That's the point, I guess. Fair enough. <laughs> well, all right, Skip. So we're you know fresh off the heels of PCA. You're back home in Nicaragua. How was the show for you guys? It was good for me. I mean, I, you know, I get up a little later. I roll in when I want. I, you know, I, I spend most of my time making the cigars. Mike, Mike has to sell them. So, um, the show's pretty laid back for me. Yeah, that was, that was fun sitting down to talk with Mike for a little, we had Caleb do all the interviews cause <laughs> you know, me and Jerry were either too hungover from the night before or, you know, Caleb had to get his little cherry pop cause it was his first show. I was definitely yeah, hanging, I was hanging over the first night too, so first yeah, day was rough. You got outvoted. That's <laughs> that's always that's always the trick is people try to stay up with me and then get up, you know, with them. Well, that was the funny part. Like we're getting ready to go in and we see you at the one bar, we're like, yo, what's up? <laughs> it's just me and Jerry, we're like cracked. <laughs> yeah, it was three in the morning. Yeah. Yeah, I was just getting started in, I think. But, yeah, I think we got there at nine though. What time did you get there at? I usually try to get in around noon every day. Yeah. That's not bad. That's it's not bad. Good strategy. Yeah. Well, what was funny about that is like, so we were scheduling with Mike for the interview. He was like, well, if you want to skip me there, you got to do later in the day. So he was prepared. <laughs> yeah. yeah. His exact, well, you know. then, you know, I remember him telling us, well, if you punk bitches want to come hang out in Austin and smoke cigars at the headquarters, do that. So we got to make our way to Texas, apparently. Yeah, you guys are always welcome. I, but I don't know why Mike has to be so aggressive about it. Yeah, he did call us punk bitches. I, I like got a little upset about it. Yeah. But it was funny. No. <laughs> you could tell he was like, I can't tell if he was like happy to be interrupted from selling for a minute or wanted to just hurry up and get back to sell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's usually the case when you talk to a guy like me. You either want to stay or just get out and leave. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's him, all right. Him Matt- and Caleb started talking about skeet shooting. Yeah. And like I was confused yeah. for a minute because every man wants to be a champion skeet shooter. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I, I haven't been, I haven't been trapping skeet shooting in a while. I need to get back out there. Gotta, it's it's kind of more fun in the colder weather than when it's super hot. All right. Well, I do have some Texas questions for you. Maybe a little bit of trivia and some cowboy stuff. I'll I'll save it for later on. Okay. Because we do got to talk about the cigar a little bit too. Yes. All right. Let's go. So we're smoking the Clovis. And obviously, this is a pretty hyped up release. I, you know, the minute it got announced, I know Jerry about creamed in his pants because he loved the Black Irish skeet shooting right there. Yeah, yeah. The champion skeet shooter. <laughs> yeah, Pro- you know, I, I, okay. I, you know, I don't, I try not to use the word hype because, um, like, hype is like you know Don King trying to get people to buy pay per view for the you know the Jerry Cooney Tyson fight. Mm-hmm. Um, but but um. You know, for me, what we've always tried to do is give people visibility to the work that we're doing kind of way ahead of time. Like some people, they, re- they, they you know, they release something and the day they release it, it's like, you know, taking the, the cloth off of the thing and the big reveal. Like for us, uh, you know, it's more like, hey, here we had this idea. Um, you know, this is what we're working on. Some, some things go, go somewhere, some things don't. 
And then as we, you know, as we know, we're going to be, you know, working on something new, we can we kind of give you kind of the, try to let you kind of in on the process of working on it and how we got from the beginning to launch. Right. So that by the time the, the launch comes, it, it's anticipated, but hopefully it's not hyped because, uh, you know, I try not to spend a whole lot of time trying to promote or sell uh, something or our products. I, I, you know, to me, it's like, all I can ask is if you, if you appreciate the work that we do buy one or two, smoke it if you like it buy more you know it, it, uh i i have no idea if you're going to like that cigar or not like that cigar i know i like it or i wouldn't release it right so um we try not to i you know we try not to hype stuff per se i can say um obviously with the transition to the pennsylvania broadly forever uh, through the transition of you know redoing the label, you guys posted a little bit here, a little bit there. So you're right. Like when it finally got to that point where the whole cigar was pictured, or the you know the the whole project was like ready to be shipped out, we already kind of had an idea of what was happening. You know, you guys kind of you kept everybody in the loop. You just weren't like one day, all right, here it is, the new the newest thing. Like we all kind of saw the process. You know, we saw the bands being picked out. Uh, you know, I'm pretty sure you guys even posted some rappers at some points. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, multiple times, I'm sure. We, uh, we, um, you know, the whole thing kind of started, uh, you know, uh, we, the last time we bought a large amount of Broadleaf was back in 2016. It was like the 2014 crop. And, um, we bought about four years worth. And then, um, you know, constantly every year working with Lancaster Leaf, working with uh, uh, Inatab, you know, working with Nika Prosa here, trying to find um, more. And every year it's like, hey, there's some broadleaf. You know, it's not the same. You'd go to look at it. The texture is not good. The, the, you know, it, it's not going to be ferment correctly. Um, because we use broadleaf binder in the uh, Neanderthal, we even bought some, uh, you know, thinking, hey, if it's binder, it's binder. Uh, it's expensive binder. But, you know, trying to get something out of it, right? And uh, our last kind of go go at it was we went to, uh, when I was in the Dominican working on King Guajanario with uh, Ernie, uh, another, another group of people told us that they had some uh, U.S. Connecticut broadleaf. And so we go into, or oh, actually, we're, we were there looking for San Andreas, and uh, and we go in, and there's like you know thirty, forty thousand pounds of broadleaf in like uh, four or five big, big, big palones, more like burrows. They, they weren't really actively fermenting; they were kind of finishing. And uh, immediately when I walked in, I knew I could smell that it was Pennsylvania, and. Uh, and also, you know, you, you, you know, just from your familiarity with the market, what's going on, there's no way someone's sitting on 40,000 pounds of this tobacco, right? So anyway, the guy says, hey, you know, Altidus is coming to pick this up uh, in the next week or two. But if you wanted to, you know, scrape off four or 5,000 pounds, um, you know, you said you were looking for it. You know, it's, it's $15 more than what you normally pay, but it's really good tobacco. So I start looking at it. I immediately, and, I, and I'm with the guy I'm with, I say, look, this is not, you know, Connecticut broadleaf. This is Pennsylvania broadleaf. He goes, well, how, you know, he goes, it looks like broadleaf. He's, you know, so he goes, it smells like broadleaf. I said, what well, is broadleaf? But it's not Connecticut broadleaf. And I said, look. So we we rolled a little fume. I said, you could just smell from the smoke. You could taste. It's Pennsylvania. I said, but listen, it's not a hundred percent finished fermenting. You know, one of two things is true. Either I'm wrong. And I don't know what I'm talking about. And this is Connecticut Broadleaf. And at the end of the day, we're going to put it on a cigar. And, and, and we're not going to know the difference because it tastes and smells and everything. Um, and performs like Connecticut Broadleaf. Or uh, it's U.S. Connecticut Broadleaf, in which case it's really good tobacco. So I'm going to buy it either way. So I, so I tell the guy, I said, hey, uh, listen, uh, I, I'm not sh Are you sure this is Connecticut Broadleaf? He's like, yeah. I said, listen. Once you guys break it down, when you put it into boxes, we want the number one, a, you know, a, the A number one darks, put, put it into, uh, into 100 count, you know, 100 pound boxes. We'll fly back out here in two weeks and we'll look at the tobacco in the boxes and 
you know, regardless of what it is, we'll, we'll buy, you know, that a grade sound tobacco for around this price. But it has to be pre-sorted. We have to prove every box. And uh, he said, oh, yeah, we'll have it ready, whatever, you know. So Mike flies down there like three weeks later because I, I was actually busy doing something else. And Mike goes in there and says, hey, they don't have it in the boxes. You know, they're basically it's exactly where it started. So we got on a conference call and I said, listen, you know, you didn't do what you say you were going to do. We wasted a trip. Um, tell me right now what it is. Because Mike's like, I'm not sure either one way or the other. I said, have you smoked it? He's like, no, no, I haven't. I said, listen, it's not Connecticut Broadleaf. So finally the guy goes, okay, yeah, it's grown in Pennsylvania, but it's it's Connecticut Broadleaf seed. I'm like, whatever the fuck that means. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, you know, <clears throat> you know so I said, I, I got, I said, put Mike back on the phone. I said, Mike, walk out of there. You know, we don't do business with people like this. So anyway, we went to another place and, um, and specifically started, you know, Mike and I had this discussion, like, look, if this is where we're at as a market where people are trying to, you know, bait and switch you on, on, you know, to the first decent tobacco we've seen in, in, you know, years, then um, maybe, maybe we need us to make a, a Pennsylvania Broadleaf product. We, we, had, we had just done Viso. We had started like kind of blending the Viso Horny. We had stopped making Fable, which was Pennsylvania Broadleaf, which we had made for a couple of years. Um, basically because just the, it was a distraction and we couldn't maintain the, 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 uh, the pieces we need to make it, you know, once every couple of years. So, um, so anyway, I, you know, I said, look, let's just buy, it's good tobacco, let's buy it and then we'll figure out something to make with it. And at that time it was going to be a completely different brand, a different core brand. Um, and then the more we got into it, you know, coming back from from working with Ernie, the more we got into, the more I got into blending it, the more I got into <laughs> talking with Alex at the, at the at the factory about what you know, the the fillers that specifically he needed to find for me. Um, and after you know working on the project with Ernie, and and able and able to have, we ended up with like ten or fifteen different kinds of fillers that we purchased from the Dominican um, that to work with in the future. Um, once it, once it kind of, it came to be, and once it started to age and everything, it, I was still using this working kind of name of this other brand, which was Visigoth. And, uh, it was kind of going to be like an extension like Baca and, uh, and, uh, it was going to be an extension to the Cro-Magnon, like Baca and Neanderthal. Right. Mm -hmm. But, um, but then, you know, as I started smoking, I'm like, you know, it's kind of like this evolution of. Of Cro-Magnon, we may still make core Cro-Magnon, uh, broadleaf Cro-Magnon, if we find tobacco. Um, it may only come out as LE versions, right, with the old label. I don't know um, if we don't find a lot of tobacco. But um, I didn't want to, because Cro-Magnon is where we started. Mike and I in the garage, you know, in 2010, talking about, you know, what we were going to call this cigar. So I didn't want to lose that uh, kind of continuity to you know, 2010 to where we started. It's really kind of the core of our brand, right? So um, it'd be like, uh, you know, Apple stopping using the word Macintosh, right? Or whatever, which is, it's kind of, it, 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 they've gone so far beyond that now, but it, but it is kind of where they started, right? Yeah. It's kind of just your derivative of it now. Like it's just Mac now. It's just the Mac. Yeah. Yeah, this is kind of like, you know, the new Coke or the, you know, <laughs> you know, however Pepsi you want to look at it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever. But it's, uh, Clear Pepsi. you know, in a lot of ways, um, it's a lot more approachable, right, than than the original. The original was, um, you know, kind of 30-year-old me or, you know, 35-year-old me making a, uh, you know, blow your head off kind of cigar that, that no one else was making at the time. Right. And, um, you know, now you want to smoke two or three cigars a day. And, and, uh, when you smoke with the old Cro-Magnon, it's like, you know, eating a big barbecue meal. It's like, you're done. You know, you know, <laughs> you know there's no more snacking. There's no more, uh, dessert. You know, you just push away from the table and hope you can walk up, you know, get up. But, um, the the new one is a lot more. Um, it's got a lot. Of, it's got a lot of the same kind of 
body and flavor without having all the same strength, right? So aside from the challenges of obviously finding good Connecticut broadleaf, uh, what were some of the other reasons that you wanted to go to the Pennsylvania broadleaf? Was it just solely based on the fact that that's what you guys came across? Yeah, I mean, like I said, you know, our plan was to continue to make Cro-Magnon and then make this other brand with Pennsylvania, just just to to, to mm-hmm. be able to make something when Cro-Magnon uh, wasn't able to be made. Like right now, we you know we're waiting on Cameroon. We we just finally got uh, this year's San Andreas, so we haven't been making Neanderthal for about five weeks or six weeks. So. Um, you know, you kind of equ- everything from Ecuador is a challenge right now. So you you always want to have things to keep the people in the factory busy, right? Absolutely. It, like like even um, even like the Palestania we make, we can't make Palestania broadleaf anymore. Like not right now. So I mean, they're they're working on you know they they launched the Connecticut, and then it's like okay, what do you do after that? It, it, you're going to have Habano. Habano is going to be a challenge. Connecticut is going to be a challenge. So you got to have some other option. Yeah, the tobacco right now is just all sorts of – there's a lot going on with it, obviously, and it's a lot of stuff that are out of control, obviously, between crops, and I'm sure there's – the you know the bulk of it's getting bought up by, you know, like an Altidus or other larger companies – so it's definitely got to be a bit of a challenge on that front. So we have the evolution of the Crow Magnet, obviously, with this Pennsylvania shade. You know, maybe Visigoth makes an appearance down the line. Obviously, I know you got some stuff going on in your brain there. So you mentioned that you've changed, obviously, how your your smoking habits are, and you originally wanted these like strong, punchy in the mouth nicotine bombs. What's your philosophy in that regard now? Because obviously. You know, a lot of Roma Craft products are known for their strong, you know, punch, so to speak. Like, I laugh every time Jerry smokes a Neanderthal because he melts in the chair. Like, if he smokes yeah, that at work. But like, I love that, though. Right. Like, that's so, what I want out of it. How do you go well, about... Uh, well, we we, st- we still okay. have Neanderthal, and, and um, it's kind of like with beer, right? Like, our office is full of these, you know, 17 18% you know, adjunct stouts like Prairie Bomb and, and Uncle Jacob and, and, you know, Rumpelstiltskin, all those things, right? Uh, heavy Avery beers and beers probably we won't, we won't ever get to at this point because, you know, I used to drink two or three of those at a time. And now I would much rather drink, uh, you know, two or three, you know, sessionable beers than, than, you know, than that. So, um, it's just your taste change, I think. Okay. Now I also think for me the hangovers get worse too. So like that's why I switch from all those heavy IPAs to like a solid Miller Lite. Just a nice, you can drink fifteen of them, and the nice next corona. day still feel okay. A nice Corona. Well, I, I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't say I turned gay. <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I, stopped, I, I said Miller Lite, not Bud Light. I still like beer, so Miller Lights out of the out of the out, out of oh, the, the piss water. Come on, yeah. man! The everyday Fuck. man's beer. Fuck! You know, <laughs> damn, That's Skip. Funny. Why you got to get at me, man? It's all I right. Mean, come on, but well, I mean, isn't there something better you guys could drink up there? Like, I okay. don't know. What's what's, what's my what's Labatt. my favorite beer? Labatt Blue. No, no. What's my favorite beer? It's Labatt. It's a hay yeah. burner. Oh, hay burner. Yeah, hay yeah. Burner. yeah it's a or, it's a seven point two percent IPA yeah. that our there local distillery oh. makes. I I can drink. Or Grolsch or oh, Rolling I Rock or uh, I'm not a big Rolling Rock guy. I I, I used to like yeah. Rolling Rock when I was 18 years old in college. PBRs, baby. PBRs, yeah, same thing. Rolling Rock was kind of like the the shiner of New York. That's the hipster, when I was the hipster beer. when I when I was up in Schenectady and and um, RPI. Um, I remember we drank a lot of Rolling Rock. What about uh, Old Vienna? You ever have an OV? No, I I don't think I ever had. It's a it's another really shitty college beer. Yeah, that's like oh, you can get it around here. It comes from Canada. Well, shitty college beer for us was like you know Milwaukee's Beast or uh, Best. <laughs> ba- oh yeah, yeah, or, oh, yeah, yeah. I like uh, Milwaukee's Beast better. It sounds yeah. more. Mil- Miller High Life, the champagne of beer. Actually, yeah, that was that was that was high that was high end for us. Yeah, uh, man. <laughs> man, Tate not Miller. Back, it was Bartles and James and Zima's too back then. Oh, Zima. Zima. Now it's now it's friggin' White Claws and High Noons. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. 
White Claw is the Zima. It's like, you <laughs> the know, the, the Generation yeah. Z thinks they invented it. Yeah, right. So Skip yeah. calls me gay. He's like, oh, man, you know, I, I didn't turn gay. I didn't say but, you were but gay. That, no, 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 I know. But, but then, like, that's how I feel about the guys that drink White Claw, or, like, you know, White Claws and fucking High Noons all day. Listen, there Look, is man, no laws when you like, you're drinking you like what You like what you like. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's a spectrum. I'm not saying you, you take it up the... You know, from behind, I, but maybe maybe you lick the tip a little bit. But butt chugs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so well, God, what? <laughs> All right. So now to piggyback off that question as well. So obviously, you know, you worked with any Ernie on the uh, Quinquagenario. You know, you've worked with a slew of people in the industry. Obviously, I'm sure that's contributed to uh, you know learning some more tricks of the trade and you know. What's something that, or someone you've worked with that's obviously influenced you now later on in your cigar constructing career? Well, I mean, obviously, number one is um, Esteban Disla, right? So when Mike and I came down here, I had yeah, I had no intention of of make of being a cigar maker. I just wanted uh, I wanted a house brand for for a new store after you know opening a store and um. Then once Mike and I decided to kind of make it, um, I wanted to understand more than I than I did understand in terms of uh, uh, as a cigar smoker and a, you know kind of having been a retailer for a couple of years. You know, I had been buying you know these kind of lost and found kind of projects from factories, and I had learned a little bit. I'd been on some factory tours, you know, the Rocky Patel tour and the Camacho tour, and I had learned a little bit. I mean, at this point, I could generally tell the difference between you know, Seco, Viso, and Lajero, um, you know, I kind of, you know, I could tell the difference between kind of Ecuador, Connecticut, and Connecticut Broadleaf, <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But uh, um, I really didn't really understand anything about um, the, the the pre-industry of tobacco. And because I'm a supply chain kind of logistics, because that's kind of was where I was coming at it from, I wanted to make a cigar and I'm like, look, I want to pay a fair price for it, but I want to understand, I want to understand what the markup is. I want to understand, uh, where the, where the tobacco is coming from. If I have to move it to another place, how do I do that? You know, uh, it, you know, uh, if, 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 if this is what I like today, how do I, how do I know, uh, if you change something or not, you know, those kinds of things. And so the, the deeper I got involved in that, the more I, I got involved in the production and then because this because the business side of, of what Esteban was doing was kind of a mess, um, and kind of the operations side of what he was doing was a mess, um, it was pretty clear early on. He you know, he had no money, he had no business experience, he had no real ability to manage the, uh kind of operationally the, the, the factory. Um, he was just a really deep experienced tobacco guy. And so um, you know, Pretty much everything, you know, 85% of what I learned, I learned working, you know, under or beside him, right? Um, you know, and this is another thing with uh, with Volstead and with Cro-Magnon. Um, you know, the last couple of years, Esteban was, you know, a little bit occupied with other stuff. I wouldn't say checked out, but he, you know, he was on the factory, you know, two hours a day, if ever, sometimes. And... Um, you know, things started kind of going kind of out of, not out of control, out of control from a statistical kind of quality perspective, like, you know, out of control, upper and lower control limit kind of idea. And, you know, things weren't being done the way they were done when, you know, before COVID when I was there eight hours a day. So um, after, you know, we kind of decided, hey, you know, this has run its course. It's time for you to do something else. Um the uh, which he was more than happy to do, by the way. <laughs> he was like, "Yeah." Um, is that like a retirement yeah. plan right there? No, no. no. I mean, he's, okay. he has his own factory now. He's doing something else. He's growing tobacco, and you know, uh, his family's more involved. I mean, he's working with his brother. So it, you know, I think it's more, you know, with the with the money he kind of earned uh, building our factory together. I think you know he's he's able to kind of go. I wouldn't want to restart at his age, but. Um, and I think, you know, he still has a lot of the same challenges. But the same way that I learned tobacco from him, I think he learned about, you know, kind of how to run a business a little bit from me. 
and his brothers also has a lot of experience there. So, you know, I, I wish him the best of luck. But the the point being that, um, you know, kind of when I went to to um, work with Ernesto Carrillo, it was with this idea that hey, now that I've now that I know what I did, what I don't know, and I know how to learn. What took me four or five years to learn before, I can learn in six months a year, right? Mm -hmm. Because now I know all the, I know the math. I just don't know the theory. You know what I mean? And so it's like, how do I, um, when I, when I went to the Dominican, it's like, okay, I want to learn if I was coming to the Dominican to make cigars, learn new regions, learn new tobaccos, you know, learn blending and bunching from your perspective, learn. The challenges you have, uh, you know, what are the best practices you have in terms of uh, managing your factory? I mean, for example, we always mismanaged. Uh, we, we never really managed packaging material that tightly. Even though I've seen packaging material bodegas in Nicaragua, I never really kind of thought it applied to us because we didn't have as much to deal with. But once we were moving to UPC labels, we exponentially increased the number of kind of things we have in the in the bill of materials and so w when i was at uh tobacco la alianza which is now casa carrillo um you know i studied a lot of how they manage their packaging materials how they checked them in how they inventory them how they check control them how they checked them out uh things like maintaining the temperature and humidity in the room so that the paper products and the glue and he adhesives are maintained uh, more effectively so those kinds of things um, just like the tobacco are things that I learned from, you know, um, from that experience. So coming back, it was like, uh, look, we got to really change what we do. We got to open up the bodega. We got to start doing our own pre-industry. Um, we're not able to find tobacco the way that we used to. So we're going to have to buy it more opportunistically. We may have to process it ourselves and still kind of where I was in making cigars, um, 10, 12 years ago, I've come a long way. But I'm kind of still at the very beginning of ferment, fermenting and processing tobacco, right? I lean really heavily on, um, you know, the guys who've been doing it for 10, 20 years. Um, you know, of course, they learn bad habits the same as they learn the right way of doing it, or they have their way of doing it. And I'm slowly developing, hey, this is how I want it done. Um, so, you know, I imagine in five or 10 years, I'll be a lot better at that. So... Um, just it's a long ass answer to your question, but that's okay. Yeah, hey, no, you're just adding more <laughs> tools, you know, to the box. So well, speak. it sounds like you're always learning and always willing to learn. And then you're always evolving and changing, which, you know, you can't get set in your ways. You got to change with everything. Yeah. You know, you can't, it's what makes your products better, more unique, everything. Well, wow. There's so many variables in tobacco. Yeah, I mean, you're just fighting, you're crazy. fighting things constantly. Uh, bad, like Gio said, bad crop storms. Uh, I mean, it, well, it's, yeah, cl you have climate change yeah. is a big thing. Yeah. Uh, you, you have like, like you, Gio said, you've got the, uh, you got the big guys trying to control the market mm -hmm. a little bit with, by controlling the supply of tobacco. Um, well, you've got, uh, that thing in Ecuador with the government takeover that, the crazy fight that they had, you know, maybe that yeah, could affect I was those say, things. I was going to say you have the political environment, mm -hmm. right? Um, even, you know, even the immigration thing affected, uh, you know, it didn't affect us so much. Um, we lost a couple people. They were really senior people that had been with us for like 10 or 12 years because that's kind of the, the type of people that take that risk and make that move, right? But uh, but more more importantly, it's like our uh, provider suppliers lost, you know, women that sort tobacco and men that, that you know, they lost people in the farm. So, you know, that, that affected us more than kind of directly. It was more, kind of more indirect. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, there's a lot of challenges, you know. And, but, again, this is kind of the reason why we keep it um, small because, uh, you know, if you – we age – we keep cigars four months after we make them. So we so if there's like a, a month or two-month bump, we've got a little bit of a cushion. And then um, we've got, you know, a year, two, three, four, five years of tobacco ahead. So, like, this broadleaf problem really – happened three years ago, four years ago. The Adapadaka problem was a whole different thing, but it kind of happened, you know, years before we stopped kind of making that cigar. So um, 
you kind of see it coming. You know, and, and again, we're not the kind of company that comes out with something, you know, six or seven new bullshit things every year. We kind of have these core lines that we've maintained for five, 10, you know, 12 years. Even your even so, your LEs are like that. I mean, yeah. your LEs are a yeah. consistent thing. Uh, you got what? Your Saber Tooth, your Black Irish. Right? Now um, Clovis. <laughs> well, yeah, Black Irish, now Clovis. You know, it's a, a, a whole new blend, a whole new thing. But I mean, and then you, you sometimes will throw out your like Quinquagenario. Uh, Volstead was a completely new line. So that was, I mean, exciting for you guys. Uh, yeah, very consistent company as far as releases through the year with a couple yeah, little we, twists. Yeah, and we've got this new this new thing um, called, because Kraft has been for the last, I, I guess, 11 years, Kraft has been, you know, kind of this d- demonstrating kind of the artistic, you know, side of making cigars um but um we started this new thing last last year with called craft maquette and um a maquette is like you know like if you're gonna like right now i'm building new cabinets for my kitchen Mm -hmm. and we're remodeling our caretaker house so i told the cabinet maker i said listen in terms of fit and finish and hardware make me a little kind of you know one fifth square you know, scale model of the cabinet. So I know the quality of wood. So I know the color of the finish. So I know the hardware, how it's going to work, you know, so that we're on the same page, like make one little small scale version of it before you make a whole bunch of it and deliver it. And I tell you, I'm not going to buy it. You know, I'm not going to take it. So, um, you know, architects do this all the time. Sculptors do it where, you know, before I make a a 50 or before I make a humongous Kobe, Bryant statue, whatever. I'm going to make a little one to, to, to just kind of show you what I'm thinking before I waste, you know, three tons of bronze or whatever, right? Makes sense. So, so what craft maquette is, is this, or, or like an architect will, will make like a little scale. You've seen those little scale yeah. buildings, right? Scale models. Basically, yeah. Basically, so you can see kind of the way movement is going to flow, so you can fit, visually see how the light's going to come in or whatever, right? Um, so at the at the at the pre industry we end up with we end up sometimes we find you know tobacco that's really interesting that we don't really know how to use yet, so we'll always buy two or three packs of it even if we don't use it. If we find really good tobacco, objectively good tobacco, but it's not something that we use, but we think it's really interesting, we'll pick up a couple of packs of it. So is that how the uh, like you did with uh, Riverside the El El, non- El Nono? Nono. Nono? Yeah, the El, that, the El Nono the El Nono was the first one. Uh, then the lightweight heavy was the second one. We're working on a third and fourth one right now, um, which hopefully will come out you know this year. But it's this combination of you know we have this really heavy San Andreas for Neanderthal, but no matter how diligently you buy it you end up with some that's a little bit more claro you end up with some that has a little bit less texture so you know what do you do with that tobacco what we try to do with it is we try to trade it to other people for for the things so like somebody else makes a san andreas cigar so we'll trade that kind of tobacco that yields out uh we'll, we'll trade that to them and they'll give us filler or something like that's what we try to do but um what sometimes you know you you have you have this stuff and you're like okay you save it save it save it until you figure out okay i'm inspired i got this idea to do this thing okay and the idea behind this is that eventually um you know il nona was a one-time deal i couldn't re- replicate that if i wanted to because it had tobaccos that had just been sitting around for years and years like modern modern norte filler and and stuff like that um the uh this new one we're working on is uh, it is probably going to end up being a core line next year, mm. and it's like okay, we started making it as a uh, you know to kind of play out the blend and the tobaccos, and and once we kind of get it nailed down uh, through this maquette process, then then maybe we'll start doing it as a as a new core line. I like so that. it's like a little yeah. experimental series type thing, like a lot of. Uh... You see a lot of whiskey companies do that with different finishes to see things like that. Yeah, or it's like uh, you know you put things on the menu to see how you know how they work out, and then if people like them, then they just kind of find a permanent spot. Yeah. You know, both of the maquette uh, that were released so far, lightweight heavy and El Nono, those were two that I'm 
actually pretty upset that I never got to try. I, uh, you know, I, I had opportunities to get them and, you know, sometimes financially you're just like, dude, I can't fire on this right now. I mean, it's a tough industry sometimes, you know, it's a it, it, cigar smoking is uh, an expensive hobby for some, you know, well, it's like, it's like the, it's like there's beers that you're like, oh, that's really, but you can't, it's not pokey, man. You don't have to collect them all, you know? <laughs> I do got uh, the Pokemon. It, oh, that he's the worst with this shit. I'm the worst. But but it's one of those things where it's one of those things where uh um like when I was a little kid in elementary school, um, because we were super broke, one of the things that was kind of like an affordable collector thing was they had like NFL pencils. Really? So you had like the Dallas Cowboy pencil or the you know, you had all the teams and, and uh, you know, you're talking about a five or ten cent thing, right? But you know, they weren't available everywhere, and 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 it was more kind of like, hey, I got three, I got three Pittsburgh Steelers. Do you, you know, can I trade you one for a uh, Cleveland Browns or whatever, right? And you try to get, you know, the whole, the whole thing. All the thirty-two league. teams. Here's yeah. the question, Skip: Did you finish yeah. it? Man, I don't know. I, I'm sure I tried. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I ever did. Well, but, Skip wasn't paying attention. His math teacher fucking made him sharpen one up and use it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to use yeah. them. Well, use speaking it of it. Uh, craft, I think this ties into a conversation me and you were having earlier about the meaning of craft. Oh yeah, <laughs> <sighs> yeah. With a certain uh, someone that will just, if you want to get, no, him, I, you know, no, I don't care. It's Brian. I, I, I kind of figured out at this point. I, you know, in retrospect, I see what the whole thing was. He, 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 he regularly posts this. If there are brands you'd like to see work with Bravada, list them here, kind of thing. And Roma comes up on there, and then he sends out a message saying, hey, you know, why don't you work with us? I'm like, look, I don't really necessarily have any issue with, with working with you. It's just not really what we do, right? Like, we make cigars for ourselves. We sell them as fast as we make them. We don't really have production to make cigars for other people. Um, you know, your thing is, you know, is your thing. You're, you're bringing new people in. You're building cigar smokers, but that's not really what we do. And, you know, it's not you. It's us. You know, sorry. So – He's gotten more aggressive with trying to pull us in. So the the thing today was really, let me post something I know Skip's gonna that's gonna trigger Skip. <laughs> then when he comes in, you know his his play was, well I can't share your story. I can't let all my you know people know about you if 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 you don't partner with us and make a cigar. It's kind of you know it's kind of one of those things. I so. thought the exact words were, if you suck at using social media. <laughs> And you don't know how yeah, to tell your story. Yeah. I yeah. can't help you if you yeah. don't want to help yourself. Hey, yeah, Skip, exactly. you can, t- you can yeah. tell your story here anytime with us. <laughs> I feel like well, he loves drama. I, I don't know. I, I feel like that's his way of getting publicity and whatever. I don't it, know. If, if it gets I don't out know there, if, it gets I don't out know. there. I think it's like, why does Machine Gun Kelly put something about Eminem on a diss track You know, to get attention? So, I don't know. He re- re- uh, reinvented his entire image after that, and, and <laughs> yeah. now he's, uh, I mean, a pretty successful alternative rock artist. Well, he's yeah. not quite right. the rapper anymore. Well, he also covered up all his tattoos, and he's, he went the all-black route, the, the total blackout. Okay. Well, well, part of that's because he's been Kardashian. Oh, oh yeah, right. that's right. Uh, what's her name? So Megan it's Fox. The begin- it's it's the beginning of the end for that guy. Yeah, they're oh, boy. they're already drinking each other's blood. It's all downhill from there. Yeah, the only one they did do that weird ass Satanist shit. Mm-hmm. The only one that's been normal throughout all that whole thing is what uh, Travis, Travis Barker, Barker like, from Blink One Eighty Two. That's a dude who was like, "Yeah, fuck that, <laughs> I'm out." <laughs> yeah, I. Yeah. So anyway, that you know, the the truth the truth is is like, you know, I see those uh, I see those other guys on um, on Instagram that do the uh, the little video minute things. I forget what they're called. The reels. It's the two. It's the two guys. Yeah, they do the reels. And oh, it's like, you know, yeah, I, I, yeah. You know, like when my called. wife tells me I'm you know I'm not allowed to when my wife sees my cigar purchase or whatever you know like those silly videos. Like that's not my thing either. But if if they if they've got if they attract a different kind of cohort, I, I'm sick of seeing fifty, sixty, seven year old guys, you know, who you know are all on a CPAP machine <laughs> at night, sitting around the fucking, you know, in the same chair, and to the extent that their fucking skin is melding with oh, the shit. the vinyl naga hide or whatever, and it's like, you know, it, watching Fox News or whatever. It's like. It's like 
that's not a very active, lively cigar scene, right? Like those guys are important. That's me, by the way, I guess <laughs> uh, I'm in that cohort, but it, it's good to see younger people like, like going around the trade show right now. There was a lot of good young people to, there. It, there's a lot of young guys and, and that's good. And maybe Brian got some of those guys in maybe these, uh, I don't remember the name of these other guys. I'm, I should. I, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. Um, yeah. You meet too many people there. Hard to keep no, trying. I'm talking about these guys on yeah. Instagram. Oh, um, those, uh, yeah. I forget who we were talking. I, they made the they made the BDP. Uh, the the oh, burned, uh, burned, burned down. Burned down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Burned down. They had like a beef with Palmer. Yeah. Um. Paul, yeah, Palmer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, I got a beef with yeah. one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I was at a yeah, wedding. I, I got a. I was at a wedding with the one, and my wife walked up to him, and was like, "Hey, listen, my husband runs a cigar podcast. You guys should talk." He's like, "Yeah, I never heard of him." <laughs> like, kind of like big timed me a little bit. I was like, "What the fuck? If there's anybody here that we we should be best friends, what the fuck?" I don't. Well, I couldn't. Re- I couldn't remember their name, and I know who you guys are. So for whatever that's worth. Hey, appreciate oh, you. that. That's a job. Yeah. I think we need the sirens for that one. No, but my yeah yeah air horns. <laughs> But, but my uh, point, my point is, is that you know, I, some of the stuff Brian does, I think is you know is is good, and some of it I think is ridiculous, and I think that's part of just getting old and going, you know, and and part of that's just being you know a different kind of dude. So yeah, um, I, I got drawn into that. Yeah. So if you want to know what craft means, I'll tell you what it means let's from my it. perspective. All right, let's hear it. So, like I said in the comment to him, I would never uh, claim to have been the the people that started the craft cigar movement, whatever the fuck that means, right? Um, but I do know that the word was not really used in the context of cigars when we started. No one talked – people talked about craftsmanship, but rarely. You know, They were using words like artisan and boutique and these other words. Um, the only person that really used crafts – type thing within their within their uh uh marketing or branding was kiki burger and i was here in sle with kiki and i said listen um you know i told him the whole story you know like i'm like i'm about to tell you guys like you know i craft beer was getting started i mean the craft beer that i'm talking about was years after sam adams and the real people that started craft beer right but um at this movement, the real, the kind of like microbrewery and, and, you know, those kinds of things. Um, I was talking to the guy who owned Jester King, his name's Jeffrey Stuffings. And, and, uh, he had a real interesting story. He was like a really, um, successful, uh, intellectual property, kind of like a medical and, uh, and kind of, uh, lab kind of intellectual property stuff. Uh, and, and, you know, he said, look, I got tired of working 120 hour weeks um, to kind of lay off stress. I would I would kind of I was brewing, you know, I was making beer in my garage. And then people started asking me to make it for their weddings. And then, you know, pretty soon, you know, I had this opportunity to kind of leave this, you know, kind of ball and chain corporate kind of uh, career behind that. I really that was sucking the life out of me and I got to do something I love. And, you know, the whole Jester King idea was, you know, uh, uh, kind of making fun of Anheuser-Busch, the king of beers, <laughs> right? And the whole thing was, he's like, listen, I want to make sours. I want to make, uh, you know, these weird kind of beers that no, that not very many people really like. But but I really want to explore and do it my way and, and make the things that I like. And, um, and – he, they were really starting to get bigger. They were just moving to their new uh, place uh, out of where they were. And um, I said, man, you guys are really growing. I've seen a lot of these kind of buyouts coming, you know, and so many entrepreneurs get into business these days saying, you know, what's our five-year plan to get bought out? So they, they get capital and they say, hey, our plan is to grow this thing to a point where somebody overpays for it and then we all cash out. And he's like, listen, that's not our plan. Our plan is to keep it this size. We really don't want to distribute outside of Texas. We don't really want to distribute at all. We'd prefer people just come here and buy it or, or buy it or drink it here. And, um, but that wasn't legally possible at the time. 
And so, um, you know, his whole mentality was, listen, I do it because I love to do it. I could do other things, but this is what I love to do. I want to do things that I like, even if other people don't necessarily like them. And I want to be here. I don't, I don't want to, grow, you know, grow the, like if you have a, if, let's say you love to cook, to cook barbecue and then you, um, then you open up a little food, you start making it for your neighbors and you open up a little food truck and then you open up a couple of a, a restaurant then you open up two or three before no long, you're no longer working the, doing the thing that you love about it. Yeah. Now you're out there promoting. Now you're uh, doing the, dealing with HR issues. Now you're dealing with, um, you know, branding and all kinds of, you know, uh, accounting and all kinds of other bullshit and you're not even back there on the pit anymore right and so you know that's kind of for me the difference between what we do and what a lot of people do which is their way of doing it not better or worse is you know every time we buy tobacco i'm there i i'm you know i get it sent to me saying hey you know this is what we're about to buy what do you think you know um I'm in the factory. I, I spent 12 years there on the floor every day, almost. Uh, now we're here because Fiorello's in school, but I still travel five hours up the road to, you know, multiple times a month to, to you know, t touch, put my hands on everything. And, uh, you know, so to me, the craft piece of it is, it isn't about size or volume or it's about, um, Kind of like your involvement in, in it, and like what your purpose is, and what your uh, what's you know what you're trying to accomplish. You know, it's like um, I there's a lot of craftsmanship involved in what Padron and Davidoff do, but you know the people who own Davidoff and the people who own Padron, for the most part, aren't really involved in the day to day making of cigars anymore, right? Um, they're different kind of people. They're they're you know, office executive, and they're involved in a lot of aspects of their business. I'm not, I'm not trying to say they're not connected to it, but but it isn't what they're not in the kitchen anymore. Sure, you know what I'm saying that's a great analogy. And so, and so for like me, that. you know, craft is in, craft is when your box maker comes and and says, "Hey, hey, you know, it's a lot easier if we switch to this other kind of material instead of the kind of wood you're using." And it's like, no, I you know, I like the I like the touch, I like the smell, I like the I like the, the I like the details of this thing. I'm not concerned with the cost or the the scalability. Uh, that you know, someone says, "Hey, your your labels are hard to take off." I'm like, "Well, I, I like that paper. That's the way that paper kind of sticks together." We I can teach you how to take the label off. That's a funny without, point. They actually are yeah. pretty hard to take off. From a <laughs> but it's like, but for me. The texture and the of the paper is what makes the the label hard to, to tear apart. I could go with a laminated kind of paper like everybody else uses, where it just pops right off. But it but it, the detail of the texture of the paper is what I like. So sure. And if you're diving into like Neanderthal, you know, you take that first band off, and then the second band, you see the evolution of man. You know, there's right. more details to just the like you said. There's a lot of details in the band. Yeah. Right. So to me, that's craft, right? Craft is in kind of the, it's, you know, it's kind of like, it's the, it's like you, you can know the lyrics to a song, but you don't, can't really, if you don't feel the music, you, you know what I'm saying? Sure. So, so, you know, whatever. It's another strange what it mean, analogy I, that I know just, what it, I know what it means to me and whether it means that to other people or not, doesn't really matter. If you want to use the word, use the word. But my thing is, if you want to call yourself craft, well, first of all, and this is not me digging on on anyone in particular, but if if, if you if you've only been to Nicaragua a couple times, you know, and if you don't know the first thing about fucking you know the product that you're making, really, if it, you know, it's perfectly okay to go to a, someone who knows what they're doing, like AJ, and have a cigar made. But if you're taking whatever cigar is there trying to get a good price for it and sticking some ridiculous kind of you're, you're a marketing guy you're a brand guy you're not a cigar maker right i mean i've heard him call himself a manufacturer i've heard him call himself a distributor i've heard him call himself a retailer i don't know maybe he's a hybrid of all of, of kind of a lot of things but he's certainly not a cigar maker right so and so I, excuse me it's a good way so, to put things in yeah. perspective i don't i don't know what maybe he's a craft marketer 
whatever the fuck that means, <laughs> right? But he's, you know, he's not a cigar maker. So um, it's like stay in your lane, bro. I got a question. You probably don't get this a lot. Do you still love it? I love making cigars. Okay. Um, I love uh, the process of it. I love working with a guy like Alex, who's like a like like I was twenty years ago, like a like a you know a, a kid in a candy store, and he's just every day he's learning, right? Yeah. So I love that aspect of it. I love uh, you know the. 27 year old single mom who whose husband's gone off to the United States and who started with me when she was 18 who you know I, I've kind of grown up she's grown up with me you know what I mean and 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 you know we take care of each other so I I love you know I love seeing these knucklehead guys in, in the factory you know finally settle down and try to you know build a life and they are having new babies and so you know I I love I love that aspect of it um, you, you definitely I don't, love the craft. I don't, that's yeah. for sure. You definitely. That, right, I, that's a great. I don't. I don't. Too. I don't. I don't yeah. love the industry. <laughs> yeah. Like you know, like the, the the every fucking day it's something. It's like I gotta kind of stay away from it, but or it'll just kind of corrupt. Because I don't know how to just ignore it like Mike does. Even in the media, it's the same thing. I feel like there's yeah. always drama in this industry. Uh, in fact, I I feel like that was a, a, a. I just had a conversation with somebody pretty recently. I was like. Man, this fucking industry is so drama filled, man. Like, even as just a media person, like we cover, we interview guys like you, we talk about your products, and there's still drama that comes with it. I mean, it's it's crazy, it's crazy to me. I just thought, like, when you're the average consumer of cigars, you sit around, you smoke a cigar at a wedding. It's an occasional <laughs> thing, you know. Like for most guys, this isn't a lifestyle. Like, this is something that. You know, Caleb, Gio, and I, we've made a part of our life. You know, this is something that we enjoy doing. We enjoy having these conversations with people like you and, you know, letting you guys take time out of your days and, and you know, hang out with us and just talk about your products and, you know, talk about what's going on in the companies. And it's still life. so drama filled. It's just, it's crazy. But it's also nice to be able to just, it's, it's humbling to know that there's still parts of, you know, the guys at the top that are, you know, you're willing to sit down with guys like us and just shoot the shit for an hour out of your day. Yeah. And well, well, you guys, you guys have run into this recently with, (laughs) with, you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but here's the thing, right? So you guys are just enthusiasts. You like what you do. You're like, Hey, um, we've got a voice. We've got, we've got, uh, something to say. So let's, if we're going to sit around the, in the garage bullshitting, uh, and talking about cigars or whatever, then let's turn on a uh, uh, let's turn on a, a voice recorder and, and a camera and and you know make a podcast, right? And and then you realize it's actually a little bit more work than you thought it was going to be, and and then you're like, okay, how are we going to pay? Ain't that the truth? How are we going to pay for these? How are we going to pay for this equipment? How are we going to pay for these cigars? You know, we got to get some sponsors or something. I get all that. We need sponsors. Right? But again, it goes back to you know you started cooking in your backyard for each other. You know, hey. You know, whatever, because you like you like grilling, and then now now all of a sudden you, you guys are running you know uh, a food truck. You know, yeah. so, I'm the guy Fury of this fucking this fucking garage, <laughs> and, these, and these two idiots I'm that I love <laughs> like my absolute brothers. These two but, idiots, but me, I couldn't do it without say, them though. I'm happy let me to say, be for example, if you if you guys had said, "Look, Skip, I appreciate you giving us this cigar, but." Um, you know, I like the old one better. Uh, this one, I, you know, it's just, it's, it's not that it's bad. It's just I don't love it. You know, I, I, I wouldn't take that personal. If you smoked one of our cigars and said, dude, you know, I smoked that, uh, that whatever. And honestly, man, it, it's just like, it just is not good. Like, I don't like the taste of it at all. I'd be like, hey, you know, cool. Right. Like, I'm not going to take it personal. There's, there's, there are people in this business who, if you say, hey, this cigar is just really not good and, you know, whoever made it took some shortcuts and, and, you know, it's painted or it's, uh, you know, it's cooked or whatever. That person knows that what they what you're saying is true. They just don't like that you're saying it. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, um, some people in this business, if you say, Hey dude, this is painted, right? This is, he goes, yeah, the, you know, it's what it is, man. You know, that, that rap is impossible to find. Uh, they had to, they had to do something to make, you know, they had to do something to make it all the same color, whatever. You know how it is. I'm like, yeah. Uh, 
But these are things yeah. as a media guy you don't fucking think about. I just want to have a conversation with you guys, shoot the shit, and then other under other industry guys fucking we get caught in the middle of it. Yeah. Yeah. No. I. Yeah. Well, you are in the middle of it. You're not getting. You're not. <laughs> no, we're in the middle of it. Like you, there, you, there is no getting out of it. You, you've walked into the mosh pit. You can't complain when the fucking yeah. guy whacks you in the in the jaw. I agree right? with yeah. you. I agree with yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We're, I uh, mean, yeah. we made the trip to Vegas. We're we're in the industry. Yeah. Uh, thanks to, like Jerry said, these knuckleheads. Right. Yeah. We branched out. You well, know, I, I, mean, I like how though we've evolved since the first. Like, so when we first met you last year, like I remember you made a little joke to uh, Mike about how oh your entourage just keeps finding stray cats or something along those lines, <laughs> picking up strays. <laughs> yeah. But you know, no, that's good, man. Like I said, it's it's a it's a it's a good sign that that there's younger guys getting in you know i mean the cigar media is a lot different than it was you know kind when i was younger there was no there was cigar aficionado right which was basically a a publishing company and then there was enthusiast right Mm -hmm. i mean you know there were there were groups on there were news groups and then there were a couple of rss feeds or uh or uh Kind of the early blogs, I, I yeah. forgot. Um, uh, what were they called? News groups and um, whatever. It was basically like a. It was before the World Wide Web, but it was basically like a static page. And um, um, I mean, essentially, they were enthusiasts. Rarely, they would get it. They would get to go to Nicaragua or the Dominican. Um, more, more, more likely, they were meeting industry people. When no one gave a shit about anyone in the industry, they were meeting industry people kind of uh, through their retailers, um, and they really just wanted to know more, right, about this thing that they loved. And uh, those are the guys, those are the guys who like really cigar geeked out, where they were just like, "I gotta find the person who's making the product that I love." Those, yeah, I heard a couple stories from the, about those guys. I mean, that was me. I mean, you know, I you know, I had a friend. I had a friend who had a restaurant. He had like a a, a nice uh, cigar area. It was in Virginia Beach. It was called Crocs, and um, I met Wayne Suarez there um, for the first time. Who was married to Cynthia uh, Fuente Suarez. Um, uh, so Wayne was kind of like the main guy at Arturo Fuente at that time, and kind of when Opus X was was taken off. I mean, Carlito was always in the Dominican, so he wasn't even involved on really on the marketing side with average kind of smokers. Um, I met um, I met, a, I met a lot of people in those early days. Uh, Tony Barani, you know, that was what it was. Um, but yeah, and, and um, it wasn't so much like meeting a rock star as it was like like I said, meeting the guy who made a beer that you liked. Yeah. Or a, or, or getting the chef to come out of the kitchen, you know, after you enjoyed a meal. It was more that than it was kind of like this, you know, cult of personality thing that it's become now. It was more like, hey man, do you know I love barbecue, and you meet Aaron Franklin. You know what I mean? Now Aaron Franklin's kind of become. You guys know who Aaron Franklin is? <laughs> I have no clue. I'm not even yeah, gonna say. Fr- yeah, I'm not even gonna pretend. Uh, he he has a master class on on Texas barbecue, right? I mean, he, you know. But Aaron Franklin, you know, if you really are deep in the game, Aaron Franklin was before he opened Franklin with the four hour line every day. Aaron Franklin was kind of an understudy at Louis Mueller's, and the guy that was right next to him in the pit. Um, is now kind of the pit master at, at Style Switch. So there's a, kind of this whole school of people that came out of Louis Mueller. And um, Louis Mueller's kind of fucked up kids and, you know, whatever. And so <laughs> if, you know, it's like one thing to love barbecue. And it's another thing to get into a car and, and hit 20 of the best barbecue places in the world in, in, two, in two days, right? And then and then kind of you get so into it, you want you know, hey, there's this – this school from this part of Lockhart, there's a school from Taylor, there's a school from, you know, um, you know, Snow's kind of east east of that. So um, that's what the cigar thing was. Now it's kind of more, you know, it's like it's more like the way that the, you know, the the, the beer business has gotten, I guess, where. Or kind of like the weed business is getting, you know, it's more, it's yeah. becoming more, 
it's becoming more corporatized. It's yeah. becoming more um, endorsement driven. There's, there's still a pretty low. I mean, look, these old these old big brands, they don't want to go out on the road 200 days a year. They don't want. They can't appeal the way that these younger guys can to to, to your generation. So they want to get personalities. They want to get a Matt Booth. They want to buy a Matt Booth. They want to buy a a, a Sean Williams. They want to buy a um, a Nick Goss from the Northeast, right? They want to buy a um, called well Jeremy recently. Jeremy from the Wildfire, right? They they want to buy these guys, these personalities, and, and build these guys so they can go out on the road and kind of you know groom your generation into kind of the, but for my generation, it was never about the personality, you know, Matt boots, a, a perfectly nice guy, but you know, nice to meet you. I want to talk to the guy who actually is blending the cigars. I want to talk to the guy who's actually making the cigars because I want to learn about the cigars. I don't really care about, you know, talking about dicks in your mouth or whatever the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> that's right? yeah, that's yeah. how me and Matt talk. We are, we, we, right. K- we're K- on that Caleb gets a little weird sometimes. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like, I'm not, I'm not saying that's a, that's a bad thing. I mean, if that's your thing. But I'm saying, well, I never was interested in that shiny object. I was kind of more interested in the guy in the background who's, you know, mm. I wasn't interested in the, the, you know, the, the guy up front on the microphone with, you know, the Drake, I was more interested in the guy in the back making the, making the beat, you know what I mean? Okay. And so in a lot of ways that's changed. I think you just took us to uh skip school right there. A yeah. little bit of skip school. Well, we didn't get the full skip school, like the Texas, uh, <laughs> but kids don't skip school. Don't skip school. <laughs> don't skip school. Yeah. We didn't get the full Texas experience or down I tried at the to, factory too, I, but that's two different levels. That's like going to high school and then college. I'm trying to use analogies so I don't hurt anyone's feelings. You know yeah. what I mean? No, I, so, you explained uh, it really well. Yeah, I agree. I'm going to I'm gonna tail off here because you've talked about barbecue a lot, and I asked Mike the same question. So the most famous barbecue place I know in Texas is Salt Lick. Is it as good as they make it seem? No, Salt Lick is like a tourist trap. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's where I went yeah. when I was in Austin. So I'm not saying it's that's bad. That's our I mean, bar. The, the, the worst barbecue in Austin is probably better than 90% of the barbecue oh. in the rest of the world, right? Um, Salt Lake is perfectly edible, but it's basically a um, it's basically a commercialized kind of touristy thing. Yeah, now. that made like Food Network and some. I don't remember what show I randomly saw, and I was like, "Oh crap!" And like, you can order their sauces. Well, it's ninety dollars for a case. I was like, "Yeah, fuck that." Plus the fifty dollars to ship it. <laughs> I think it's a good place to to start, but you know, barbecue doesn't really require sauce. Number mm-hmm. one. And, Sauce is more of a lubricant than a condiment, you know. Okay. Who am I talking to? Skip Martin or fucking Matt Booth? <laughs> uh, practice safe condiments, y'all. <laughs> yeah. Don't forget the lube. Either. I mean, I mean, it, the sauce is really kind of, you know, if if the meat's drying out a little bit, or if you're trying to get more of it down, the sauce helps a little bit. But you're not really trying to, you know, it's like the uh, don't drown your yeah. food kind of thing. I like burn ends, so I heard they got Ooh. good ones. All right, Kansas City is a is more kind of a burn in place, but yeah. Okay. All right, Skip. Before we end things here, getting close to the end, I have some random questions I want to throw at you. Maybe like a speed round, but I want to see where do you want to go? Do you want to go Cowboys trivia, a little bit of Texas knowledge, <clears throat> or I got some rap lyrics and I want to see if you can name the artist. Which way? Which way do you want to go? Because I, <clears throat> I see you're an old school rap do, guy. Do a couple of questions from all of those. I don't. I... Okay, we could do a little rapid fire. So. uh <laughs> We're going to start with Texas. If I, if I don't know it, is it that I, that I never knew it? It's probably because I've forgotten it, but go ahead. All right, we're going to start with Texas. What is the Texas state dance? Is it the Macarena, the square dance, or the Texas waltz? Uh, oh, I, don't, I didn't know we had an official. I would say the Cotton Eye Joe, but since that wasn't on your list, I would say the waltz. It is actually the square dance. The, which is two-stepping, I guess? I, I, or maybe just the old school. Yeah, I guess the old school square dance. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. All right. What is the Texas state motto? Is it howdy, bravery, or friendship? Uh, it's not get off my yard. <laughs> I got a Glock. Watch where you're uh, fr- at Friendship, I guess. It is friendship. You're right. I thought yeah, it was howdy. Yeah. All right. One more. Let's see what we got here. All right. One for two. Hmm. 
What we got here, Caleb? All right, hold on. I'm trying. They, to these aren't really Texas. If you ask me Texas history questions, I could tell you. Oh, but you fucked up. Ugh, I just went with you the know most basic. Okay, where, well, you guys are from New York, right? Yeah. yeah. Do you have a class in middle school called New York history? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. State history. Yes. yes. Oh, you do? Yeah. Okay. They make us. It must be really shit. boring compared to Texas history. I'm sure it is. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. We got <laughs> like we don't yeah. have an Alamo, man. They just uh, yeah, yeah. They we make got, us like, feel bad about everything. We got a lot of Indian re- like uh, tribe questions and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Ah, they make you feel you. bad about everything. How many? Beads I, I did. Was I did go to Foxwoods. How many beads was Manhattan bought for? That's like what they teach us, and they say oh, you should feel bad. Got you. Yeah. All right. Um, state tree. The apple tree, the cherry tree, or the pecan tree? A uh, pecan tree, yeah. That's right. Correct. All right. Yeah. I'm going to move The on. mockingbird is our state bird. The blue bonnet's our state flower. Oh, you, those are on the list, too. You got it right. Yeah. All right. I knew those. I'm going to go rap now. Okay, let's go. All right, this is... I can't wait to listen to Caleb sing or talk lyrics right what, now. This is going to be like Alex Trebek on Jeopardy. Yeah, I, yeah. I feel like I can't sing it because then I give the melody away, so... If you ask me anything like after two thousand uh, three, I'm probably not gonna know it. But go ahead. Oh no, this is I, I went to nineties, nineties for those. Okay, okay. All right, rolling in my five point oh with a rag top down so my hair can blow. The girl is on standby, waving just to say hi. Did you stop? No, I just drove by. Kept on pushing to the next. Vanilla level. ice. <laughs> ice ice baby. <laughs> I, I, ice ice baby. Yeah. Yeah, that was that but was. I gotta, tell, I gotta tell you. Everyone in the 90s knew that. You didn't even have to know anything about hip-hop. You, yeah, you better know that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, here that we go. That was kind of like hammer, hammer time. That was know? the $100 question. <laughs> yeah. All right, here we go. Um, I'm the Mac and I'm bad. Give you something that you never had. I'll make you bump, bump, wiggle, and shake your rump because I'd be kicking the flavor that makes you want to jump. Ooh. Mm. There's like three different references in there. <laughs> Cause you got jump from the crisscross, you got the uh, rump like rump shaker, you got uh, it's got a little bit of an LA LL Cool J feel to it, but I I don't know particularly. You said the name, you did say the name already. It, it, crisscross, crisscross, jump. <laughs> I was either gonna go with yeah. that or like the Humpty Dance. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't I, know. I don't remember that lyric in specific. I would have gotten it. zero of these so far. So yeah. you wouldn't have gotten yeah. Vanilla Ice, uh, maybe if you if you uh, sang them. <laughs> All right. if, if you did exactly. Do, 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 do. All right. In 2009, I'm switching. This is uh, Cowboys. What okay. city did the Dallas Cowboys play in for 2009? In, like, you mean before the new stadium? Exactly, yep. In Irving. Arlington. No, in Irving. Their new stadium's in Arlington. The original stadium was in Irving. Oh, Irving, Texas. controversy. Oh, uh, I was going to say, hold on, because it says for four decades, from 71 to 2000, the Cowboys played in Irving, Texas, and then the yeah. new stadium is in Arlington. That's exa- He was right. Oh, he was that's wrong. what he just said. I think I read it backwards. You fucked up. Yeah, yeah. I'm dyslexic. Caleb is dyslexic. No, I, I, uh, I, I went to that stadium in the 70s to watch a football game, believe it or not. Did they lose? I'm <laughs> sure they did. <laughs> we we suck. Actually, we were good in the 70s. McDonald's used to put out a commercial, I mean, a, a poster every year. Uh, it had, like, all like the team picture. And it was, like, the number one was Rafael Septian. And it went, you know, kind of all the way to Danny White, Roger Staubach, you know, Looney Dorsett, all the way up to Randy White and Two Tall Jones. But I, I could name every player from number one up to, like, number 99, right? All right. Here's a 70s question for you. Yeah. What yeah. team dashed the Cowboys' hopes for the third straight NFL championship game appearance? By defeating them in the 1979 playoffs. Ooh, 79. It was the last game of Roger Staubach's career. The Steelers or the Redskins, I would think. It was the Rams, actually. Los Ah. Angeles Rams. Dan Fout? Is that Dan Fout? Uh, He might have been. I can't remember. Yeah, you were, <laughs> I can't remember. Yeah, you were a twinkle in your dad's nut still. Here, here, Google that, Jerry. Who was the quarterback of the of the Rams in the in the seventy nine? I'll Google it while Caleb's yeah. talking to you. All right. The Cowboys receiver was drafted from Oklahoma State in the twenty ten NFL draft. He decided to wear number eighty eight. What is this receiver's name? This in which year the draft? quarterback was Pat Hayden. Uh what year draft, Caleb? Uh two thousand ten. Uh, uh Oklahoma receiver wore eighty eight. 
Des Bryant? Correct. So here's a question. Do you know the other two or three that have worn 88? Michael Irvin. Uh, yeah. CD. CD Lamb. Yeah. And Another one. Ooh. Drew, Drew Pearson was 88, right? Is that what year was that? Where were we going? That was that was before Irvin. Like okay, yeah, I, wanna... I, I think Drew Pearson was eighty eight. Also, who's the dude who dropped the wide open pass in the end zone in like the Super Bowl or something like that? Oh, there's been a dozen of them, probably. <laughs> <laughs> How are we going to talk? Didn't Dallas beat us twice in the Super yeah. Bowl? Yeah, we can't we're, talk. We're, we're we're good at blowing the big lead. All yeah. right, <clears throat> this question has a Buffalo tie. So, what coach did not get a Super Bowl ring with the Cowboys? Purcells. Chan Gailey. Bill Purcell. Ah. Chan Gailey. I Chan miss him, Gailey, man. He was yeah. a good offensive coach, Wait, man. Did did Bill Purcells get a Purcells got a ring? I, did he? I thought it was uh Jerry Johnson and Switzer. Ooh. Uh I just know Parcells won a Super Bowl, but it was with the Giants for sure. No, I'm saying with the Cow when he was with the Cowboys. Right? Oh, I don't think he got one with the Cowboys. It was Jimmy Johnson, I think back to back and then because they had the three peat in the nineties, right? Not the three peat, yeah. but yeah, they, the three, yeah, and, four out, three yeah. and four or something like that. Yeah, they beat us twice. Yeah. All right. Um, what? Who was given the nickname Mister Cowboy and was the Cowboys' first overall draft pick? Mister Cowboy. This is going back to sixty sixty one. Um. Give me initials. B L. I don't know. B L B is in boy. B, yeah, B is in boy. B L. Oh, oh, yeah. He's in the Ring of Honor. Um. Uh. So I, this is one of those I know, but I forgot. Uh, uh, if if you, I'll come back to this one. Pass. All right. <laughs> the Cowboys were the first team in Super Bowl history to hold their opponent without a touchdown. What team did they play against? And this and the score is twenty four to three. Um, they what got year was this? Uh, it's Super Bowl six. The Bills? Oh, the Dolphins. The oh, Bills. Dolphins. Okay. The Dolphins. All right, let me see. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, uh, I'm Bob Lilly. There you go. It was Bob Lilly. You're right. Yeah. 100% correct. See, when you get to my age, you have to stop th- thinking. It's like trying to poop. You got to or pee. You, got, you can't if you focus on it. It's not work or get a boner, right? It just doesn't work. All right, work, work. You, uh, it's got to come to you. It's got to come to you after. They got a pill for that. <laughs> All right, last last one. What teams did the Dallas Cowboys beat in Super Bowl six, twelve, twenty seven, twenty eight, and thirty? Yeah, well, he already told you six. True. Yeah, yeah, you got six. So you got the Dolphins. So there's Man, three I, other teams, and one. You team know, honestly, was I remember twice. the NFC Championship games always a lot better than I remember the who we played in the Super Bowl. I, I don't remember like you know people say, oh, I remember in this you know third quarter of 1983 this happened. I'm like, I don't remember that stuff like that. That's my dad. Uh, my dad can tell it, me yeah. shit like that. My, my it, brain's not built that way. Wasn't it, obviously it's the Bills twice. Yes, the Bills are Steelers. Twice. Steelers, yep. And there's one more. Yeah. Uh, Midwest team. Midwest, Obviously. West Coast team. Uh, Redskins? Well, no, the Redskins are NFC. It couldn't have been them. Yeah, yeah, no, I don't know. I don't know. The Broncos. Oh. Broncos. So they ah, beated okay, yeah. Elway, I remember I believe. The, yeah. I remember the Broncos game. All right, that, that, those are the little quiz segment right there. I had a little bit of uh, everything. I'm also, not a, I'm, not, I'm also not one of those people that... Uh, like dives in to memorize facts and figures of uh, or history of things. You know what I mean? You did pretty well uh, though. Of, of sports or uh, yeah, like even rap. I was talking to you know, like when you talk to people about rap, it's like you know they. It's like the more encyclopedic your knowledge, it makes you a better fan. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not like that. I don't think I. When I was a kid, we used to play a game called Stratomatic, which which was like a a combination of like a like dozen of dragons with. Baseball cards is the easiest way to say it. So you'd like, you'd like throw the dice and it would give you a probability and you'd look at their stats on the baseball card and, and it would determine if you hit a, a double or a triple or, or struck out depending on who you were, 
the ERA of the pitcher you were pitching against. And basically, you'd play like a little game of baseball with baseball cards, right? Interesting. So, I remember so it was kind of like that. fantasy baseball before fantasy baseball, I guess. I'm um, in my fantasy hockey league right now. It's a fucking nightmare. This dude's goalie <laughs> for Dallas, ironically. Uh, Ottinger just posted back to back shutouts. I'm in some trouble. Yeah, I don't even. I don't even really understand hockey, to be honest with you. <laughs> it is. We're a north. It's a northeast sport, but somehow all the warm weather teams are good. Yeah, I wa- I used to watch it a couple times when I was a kid. We used to go see the Dallas Stars. Or, uh, Mike Madonna. Da- no, I'm sorry. There was a Dallas Blackhawks. Really? And then, and then um, when I was in Virginia in the Navy, there, uh, there used to uh, used to be the uh, Admirals, the Tidewater Admirals. It was like a minor league team that I like to watch, but it was always fun to go. But I I couldn't even really. I didn't really understand the rules, to be honest with you. So Dude, you had like, Mike Madonna in his prime. Like, that was, man, what a team that was. They beat us in the Stanley Cup final. Who? The Dallas Stars. 99. 1999. No, 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 it wasn't the Stars. This was, uh, sorry, I sh- the Blackhawks. It was like the Chicago farm team before the uh, Stars. They played in existed. Dallas? Yeah. yeah, yeah. They played at the State Fairground where the Cotton Bowl is. Yeah, we're one of the only team. Like, I feel we're one of the few teams that actually have our like minor league affiliate like two hours away. It's an hour away in Rochester. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Skip, I got one last question for you, man. Uh, This is going to be hitting the market probably any any week now, right? The the Clovis. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's already been ordered. Uh, It's already been made. Um, I'm not completely happy with the way it's smoking yet, so so I'm going to give it a little more time. This one I might sit on for a year after we made it before I send it out there. It's not as sweet, uh, so you don't have enough to, to offset the candela the way that the Black Irish does. Like for me, the um, the saber tooth is a better is a better c- uh, cigar t- than the Black Irish, and I think the Black Irish is probably better than the Clovis, but. You know, everybody has different preferences. I mean, so it's good these tobacco. aren't shipping it's, to retailers, or no? What the Clovis? Yeah. At some point, I, I, they're made. I just I'm not ready to to release them yet. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, was... I mean, I, I really kind of want the core line to get a um, kind Let's of a shine. running start before we start putting LEs out there. Okay. okay. So, yeah. I, but yeah, I, we started I, making we started making them um, fucking same time. I mean, back in august of last year so the, the ones you're smoking are probably close to seven eight months old eight nine months old yeah we got to give a special shout out to alex because he made these possible i remember that at the yeah. show yeah. I, yeah I also got to say we're probably going to be I, I would have to assume the the first review of them yeah yeah just enjoy them man you don't need to review them <laughs> it's being reviewed, but it's and notable. actually, I I I actually like the cigar personally. Uh, I can see what you're saying though, as far as the taste. So I didn't smoke. I mean, if, if I if I didn't like it, I would have never released it. Right? Sure, but yeah. uh, but um, well, we had a sidebar conversation at the show. I think the people who really love the Black Irish, which which to me is it's you know 99 percent the same cigar as the EMH, but sometimes people just like chasing. Uh, shit they can't get. <coughs> Jerry. Um, <laughs> why you got to put me on the spot I mean, like that? To me, to me, the Sabretooth is legitimately, I like it more than the EMH Aquatine. Uh, but the the Black Irish, uh, to me, is not that much different than the EMH Cro-Magnon. In, the, in, this, in this line, the, the Clovis is definitely a different cigar than the Core line. You know, just adding that one leaf makes a big difference. So... Um, you know, I think you'll like it or, or not like it, but, you know, don't chase it. Yeah. Like, you know. I have one last question about the box. Are you guys going to do something different with the box? Or are you guys going to slap a sticker on it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because I talked to Mike about this, and uh, Mike was like, oh, well, listen, that, was, that wasn't like a real thing. That was, uh, you yeah. know. Yeah. You know. So well, that was, so, that was something the I was doing for John. And then, and then John, like in the middle of that uh uh, got a new job at 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 at, uh, at the Evil Empire, so I basically was like, you know what, fuck it, just just whatever, I don't care at this point. But um, the um, I like the cigar a lot, though. Yeah, yeah it'll be a diff- It'll be a different. Uh, it'll be a different logo on there, probably. I don't know exactly what, but 
It'll be something different. Painted cool. on there, not yeah. a sticker. Cool. Yeah. On the on the inside of the box, not on the salt like the the plastic on the outside. The down to her right, logo. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Got to well, get see, them subscribers. Talk, on maybe I won't even release it now. You guys are making me. <laughs> no, no. Very very enjoyable smoke. Very it actually, uh, I have my review done on it. Uh, yeah, man, I, I I actually really like it. So I I think it's something you guys should be proud of, and uh, for sure. In the very near future, we're going to be doing the uh, the Pennsylvania broadleaf Cro-Magnon. Uh, yeah, that, yeah. To me, the the knuckle dragger and the mandible in that line are bangers. So it's it's the whole line's good. So yeah. But now I'm, you know this thing I'm working on right now. This new this new um, it's it's called Mastranza. Ooh, be on the lookout really, for that, folks. It's really good. It's going to be a maquette project first, but. Um, it's probably going to end up being a, a, a new core line. And what, what's funny about this one is, so there was a, the first episode, the first year of chef's table, there was an episode with the, the uh, Argentinian chef in, in Patagonia. And he talks about this, this idea of Mastranza. And uh, so, you know, I, I immediately, while I'm watching it, I sent a, a text to, to Frank Herrera. I said, Hey, can you trademark this? He did a search and then COVID happened and he never fucking did it. So then I'm working on it like three years ago uh, and or two years ago, right after COVID. And uh, someone sends me a message goes, hey, there's a cigar with this name in Europe. The Marifels have it. And so fast forward, um, I'm meeting with the Marifels about it. And, and, they, and, he, and I said, hey, where did you get the idea for this? He goes, I got it from the episode of Chef's Table. <laughs> and I'm like, me too. The same exact thing. <laughs> And so, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, they're going to make it in Europe. We're going to make, uh, we're going to be able to use the mark in the U.S. And we kind of agreed on that. So, um, but I, I've been working on this project for probably five or five years now. So it's a, uh, that's a really good one. It's, um, it, you know, again, there's this kind of like now that I'm kind of back doing the stuff by myself. And I had this kind of new palette of colors to work with. This new kinds of tobacco. It's uh, it's kind of you know, it's the the new stuff is Volstead, Pennsylvania. Uh, this new stuff, I think it's all it's all on another level. Well, one thing I did want to touch on too, because we're obviously, like I said, we're winding down. Uh, really, really, actually, a fan of the Volsteads. Those are something that I keep on hand. You know five at a time usually when i get to grab it's one of my like favorite cigars you guys did and as they're getting rare like i said i think i mentioned this to the guys the quinquagenario is one of my favorite cigars you did last year i can't wait for the next rendition you guys do from mike uh so you know keep on doing what you're doing i'm really appreciating what you're putting out man thanks guys and, and i like what you guys are doing you know this is uh <clears throat> I'd rather sit and just kind of have one of these kind of conversations to talk about things in general than try to, you know, sell our cigars. Sure, man. Hey, man. We appreciate you taking time out of your day, man. Uh, we'll let you get back to Call of Duty and maybe hop in that pool. Yeah. It looks heated. Send Jerry your no, gamer tag. He'll drop in with you. <laughs> it, it's about it's about 97 degrees here Ooh, uh, today. So. Oh, man. Uh, it's, I, I saw, it's, I saw it's, uh, North, it's April, it April 4th and it's, it's snowing, 34 it's snowing right outside right now in Buffalo. Yeah. It's, it's oddly, oddly hot, right? In fact, tomorrow Fiorella school is letting out half day because of the heat. Heat days instead of snow days. Must be nice. Yeah. Well, we get an eclipse day coming up. So nice. yeah. Yeah. We the, got that cool eclipse coming up. Somehow that solar eclipse thing, apparently Buffalo is like the perfect viewing point. So Oh, it's in that band? Yeah. So they literally close down schools. Every hotel is booked. We got like, so, because obviously we're police, like, like yeah, there's special eclipse details. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> eh, wah. Yeah. Well, you guys keep doing what you're doing. I appreciate it. Um, we'll talk to you too. Uh, talk to you real soon, Skip. We appreciate clear, you, brother. Steer, steer clear of the drama. Of oh course. yeah, man. You too, like, man. You too. Like, like I do. Like I do. Yeah, yeah. You know. Make sure you learn how to use fucking social media. You know. These, I'm uh, working. I'm working on it. Don't these, take the bait. <laughs> yeah. Don't. Don't bite. Don't bite, man. <laughs> exactly. Don't bite for little don't, fish. Don't be a hater. Yeah. yeah. Don't be a hater. That's important. Mm. That All right, guys. 
Take it easy, brother. See you, man. Yeah, y'all yeah, yeah, too, man. Skip Martin, Roma Craft. Second time on the show. Great guy. Always appreciate having him on. Uh, still a lot to get to. Uh, we can jump right into that, Caleb. Yeah, we can motor you, on right through it. What do you think? So now it is time for Patrol Gone Wild, brought to you by Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust, makers of fine cigars such as Mikidia, Sin Compromiso, Sober Misa, and many others. That being said, Patrol Gone Wild, we're doing it big. All right, up first, we got a video, um, and I'll give you a little background on this. We have a disgruntled ex-employee leads police on a slow-speed chase with a bulldozer before crashing. This is out of Gwinnett County, Georgia, uh, stealing a 75,000-pound tractor, uh, leading police on a slow chase uh, where another employee with a bulldozer flipped (laughs) the employee out of the bulldozer, and that's how he got caught. So here's the video. Demolition theory. Holy shit. <laughs> they tell him to flip it too. Keep him up! Hey! Flip it! Flip it! Flip it! All right, so what makes this story so amazing to me is Gio and I have actually been in a chase where a man was operating a bulldozer, and he stole it from a job site, and he had did this exact same thing. Uh, He just ran into an area where he just couldn't go anymore, and he gave himself up. And he didn't want to crash into a building. And he's a veteran. Yeah. He made sure he let us know that. How many times, Gio? Yeah, and then had to go get a psych evaluation. It was just awesome. No criminal charges. Uh, he just... Really? He... he this dude needed some serious he needed help. help. Oh, okay. He yeah. needed help. Like, well, didn't make any goddamn sense. This was, like I said, disgruntled uh, former employee. was actually the guy of the company's neighbor. Uh, obviously angry. Stole the bulldozer. And uh, it remains to be seen what charges this guy, Sanchez, will be facing. But to this day, he's still in jail right now. Good for him. <laughs> it's, it's so, see, where did this happen? Gwinnett County, Georgia. All right, so that's Georgia. Yeah. Uh, in New York, uh, no, we just we just make sure that this man <laughs> is uh, he's okay here in the noggin. Let's just flip it. I, I mean, it. we can agree that there's a lot difference there. This guy just did it because he was pissed off. He's definitely probably a little because uh, how mad do you have to get to fucking? I'm gonna steal your fucking bulldozer. All right, now we're gonna address the awesomeness. That guy that got to flip it with the bulldozer, when he heard the flip it, he was like, fuck yeah. <laughs> that guy was so excited. He was happy. He didn't even care about the bulldozer. He was like, yeah, get out of my get out of my ride. This is for insurance purposes. <laughs> Probably could be. Actually, is that even covered? Because that was like, essentially, you did it to your own product. I don't know. I don't think uh, you cared. I don't know. That's the... So, like... All right. If you're, you're an insurance adjuster, like, I feel like they find a way to not cover shit, so... Yeah, health insurance, but uh, yeah, you're right. They do whatever they can to not cover. Yeah. All right, which way do we want to go? Geo story or the other story? Yeah, we'll go to Geo. All right, right, let me just pull up my... uh... Another video, I believe, right? So uh, I have a clip of this here. Uh, That's a still image. Did I send you the video of it? I hope you did. If not, we can figure something out here. I think I might have actually made a boo-boo and did not do that, so... We'll We're, let Caleb get to his yeah, story. I'm going to really quickly Caleb has this. another one, and then we'll, 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 we'll get to that after. It's okay, buddy. All yeah. right. We have a drunk Delta pilot with a blood alcohol uh, <laughs> blood alcohol level over twice the legal limit. Limit was caught before a flight to New York City, and he just learned his fate. So uh, we actually, I think we did talk about this in the past. So this is kind of like a follow-up. We have Lawrence Russell, 63, also from Georgia, uh, learned his fate before pleading guilty in Scotland. So it was uh, flying from Scotland to New York. So he got in a lot of trouble for being twice the legal limit, drunk. Uh, this guy partied way, 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 way too much. Uh, Is he, this the same story where like he kind of, like the, the, the flight attendants were like, what the fuck? This dude's trashed. We it, can't let him fly. Yeah, they actually found a half-empty bottle of Jaeger in his carry-on luggage. Good for him. Um, obviously, he had way more liquids than you're allowed to bring on. Uh, the pilot said he had not been drunk recently, but was drinking the previous uh, evening. Uh, he also had a bunch of pills, too. 
So uh, he got in trouble, took him in custody, and no other previous convictions until this time. Uh, but they said he had multiple run-ins with DWIs, like oh, possibly. Uh, he's very remorseful. Uh, and he uh, he's in jail right now. But when he gets out of jail, he can reapply for his aviation medical certificate. So I have a question. When you're a pilot, and listen, this I'm not an advocate for drinking and driving, right? Uh, he never flew the plane. He well, and still, yeah, he never flew. They he, he got was attempted. Before. Yeah, no, it's an attempt. I mean, do I think this should be criminal? No. Should he never be able to allowed to fly a plane again? Probably. He's in jail. Well, he's they said so. Here's what it, he's in jail currently. He could reapply for his aviation medical certificate, and if granted, he could be reinstated as a former job as a captain. So he possibly could fly again. Right, but I, I guess like, see, this is a crazy different legal standard because we're talking a different country. Yeah. So and also like FFA. Yeah, like I mean, and but he's in Swedish jail, right? Or Stock- Scotland, yeah. Scotland, whatever. Scottish. Scotland Yard. Uh, yeah, I don't know how that works because like any lawyers, like yeah, but he still didn't do it. Like if this dude flew cross continental, <sighs> shit faced one. Reckless as hell, Yikes. somewhat impressive, and yeah, you definitely deserve to go to jail because you risked the entire plane's lives. You got caught beforehand. I could get an attempt, but there's still not, you know, on the culpability scale, that doesn't quite make a sense. I just don't see how he's in jail. I, I get how, like, Delta could be like, yeah, no fucking way. You're not flying with us no more. You, you, we're stripping you of your captaincy. Like, there's no way we can allow Fired, you to fly planes. Sure. Fired, but jail? He didn't fly the plane. Uh, yeah, that's crazy. But I don't know. Maybe like Scottish law might be a little uh, harsher. Did, did he did he turn the Are ignition we too on New the York? <laughs> I, I guess. Are right? we too New York? No, this is just the fucking officer in us. Like it's you think of like how the situation fits the subsections, but America other countries take any form of like driving or in this case piloting while intoxicating a lot more seriously. Like Canada it's a felony and you know, your life's kinda over. Here yeah, we'll give you like four times at the barrel. You didn't kill anyone. Delta is very supportive, and they wish him nothing but the best. So maybe they're like, we need you as a pilot. Now, I mean, uh, this guy yeah. probably has a severe... How many health. flights do you think absolutely got destroyed? How many like flights got canceled because of this? Uh, uh, probably. These guys got to know their schedule like months in advance. It's got to be like us. Yeah. I don't know, man. That's a confusing one. Uh, Jerry, did everything go over smoothly? I... For that to you, my apologies. For we that. are all We're good, good, bro. All right. We are all good. On the all right. Story. This I is... wish nothing but the best to this drunk Delta pilot. Yeah. Uh, I'm just glad. Don't fly our. You didn't plane. fly. Yeah. You didn't fly for me, and we're all good. Hey uh, guys, there's a little turbulence. <laughs> 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 all right, guys. So this little clip is from the good old Twitter sphere that I was scrolling through, and I love to bookmark anything police related, specifically to bring to you guys here. And I'm going to read the headline. Naked brawl unfolds at Venice Beach. LAPD investigates viral melee featuring a naked woman in a medieval style club. So we're going to play the clip here. Now, I gave a condensed version of this. The whole thing's like three minutes long. Yeah, I've seen this. This is some amazing video footage look at that strut yeah. oh she's hitting her with it too <laughs> and then she uh, fucked up now you got a naked woman with a club look at how the crowd <laughs> turns with this fucking little pose strut that she was doing now okay my investigation is my just automatic assumption is this lady's on crack or some form of narcotic but i'm guessing it's probably crack i hope she got tased um, oh, so it took LAPD or Venice Beach, whatever the municipality is, about six minutes to arrive on scene. Um, I just appreciate a good odd fucking naked person brawl with medieval times weapons. She had like the baseball bat with like the the nails in it. Yeah, like very 
very medieval. Yeah, they, but they called it a club. So whatever they want to phrase it here. That shit was a Louisville slugger <laughs> with a bunch of fucking five inch nails in them. Now, I got to give TMZ credit because every video I found had their fucking watermark in it. So I don't want to get sued. But uh, this was fucking hilarious to me. I can just relate to finding people with the most obscure things. Like you were off the day I found the dude with the nunchucks that, you know, fucking clonked his girl over the head with little did you know i was a nunchuck master yes and i was able to identify that as Mm -hmm. nunchucks oh god that was just a a treat uh charges are currently excuse me i'm sorry investigation is currently pending and we do not know if any charges were now on scene i could tell you exactly what happened when those officers were you know rolled up get the fuck out of here (laughs) Put the fucking club down. And someone took that and laughed about it and probably watched their body cam footage a hundred times over. Yeah. Uh And that is a story that on some Los Angeles PD's uh, phone or whatever their process is, and they are still laughing about this story probably weeks later. You remember the naked chick with the club? Yeah. Yo, dude, look at this shit. Can you believe this? (laughs) (laughs) Now, I would never, ever, ever condone that. I hope she had a nice rack, at least, or something. The blur is the worst part of the video. Mm-hmm. So, here's the thing. The actual TMZ video, there's a lot less blur. And, like, the girl looked like actually like a normal person at first, but then, like, it, she had that, like, hidden crackhead. Like, she either just started. Ah, oh, damn, mm-hmm. man. Like. Ruined potential. Wasted talent. Or, like, did that Just fuck- got another one. That or she was on, like, that fucking synthetic weed that just makes you get naked. Because it is Cali. Like, mm. you know how it is. Like, remember that shit that Zay Jones did a few years back and he almost fucking... He jumped out of his uh, jumped Tried out to of jump his out of his hotel up. window. Yeah. Broke cut, the window. It was, like, 40 leg, yeah. grand to replace the window. Cut his leg real bad. Yeah, I remember yeah. that. That was a scary video. Weird. But um, that will conclude Patrol Gone Wild. So tune in next week for another Patrol Gone Wild segment brought to you by Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust. And now we have News with Caleb. So I know this one is going to be hitting all your Tat fans right in your wallets because Tatuaje is expanding the Kahunu? Kahonu. Kahonu 2012 line and it's adding new packaging. So uh, they're replacing their 10 count boxes, uh, five different versions of the 2012 line, Broadleaf, Corojo, Habano, Sumatra, and Tuxla. Uh, with 21 count boxes, MSRP of $13 a stick, uh, regardless of the blends, and the boxes will have an MSRP of 273. So the price uh, remained the same. This was uh, shown off at the PCA trade show. We clearly saw this, took a picture. So uh, you guys, I know, will definitely be looking forward to that, right? So that Corojo one's going to be fucking bomb. That's one that I'm looking for or to. I know Jerry is probably like, fuck, should I buy the whole box of all of them? <laughs> I don't want to think about it, but uh, obviously three of them are regular production cigars. Uh, they're obviously adding the Corojo and adding the Tuxla. Uh, hey, man, it is what it is. Tuxla is very popular in the tat line <laughs> these days. Uh, somebody. Oh, yeah, me. Me. Uh, I, I actually popped in for one of the Tat Lat Mo uh, Tat Tuesday lives yeah. that he does. And Pete Johnson and Michael Herlock were talking about uh, a couple things that they have coming through the pipeline. And it it seems like there's a new pork tenderloin coming out in the Broadleaf, uh, which is, I think, the OG blend. Sorry if I'm wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, those are going to be something. Well, I know you're a Broadleaf whore. I'm praying to God. Praying to God. That they do what they did with the fucking Tuxla line. Made to and order. And they're made to order. <laughs> I'm praying. Well, all right. You're going to have a cooler full of pork tenderloin broadleaf. It, which is totally fine with me. So these are going to be set to ship to retailers in about two months. So you're looking at summertime, June. Yeah. Right there. Tat, doing your thing. Pete, we still got to link up. The fuck? <laughs> Facts. Get him, Yogi. <laughs> All right, up next, we are going, we're touching on the Year of the Dragon. So Gurkha is going to come out with four years of the Dragon Cigars ahead of the release. So they are doing uh, a couple different blends now. So they are also going to be doing uh, 
You're the Dragon 2024 with AJ Fernandez at $25 a stick. So a box of 10 will cost you $250. It's going to be an Ecuador Habano uh, and with Nicaragua, Nicaraguan binder and fillers. And then there's going to be another one, You're the Dragon, with EPC. Also, same price, $25 thick, box of 10 $250. It's going to be a Mexican San Andreas wrapper with an Ecuadorian Connecticut binder and Dominican Republic filler. Uh, ships in April. And then there's going to be one with Oliva. They did. Oh, it's Mexican San Andreas wrapper, binder, Cameroon, filler, Nicaragua. Shipping in June. And then uh, they have a Year of the Dragon with Oscar Valadares. Uh, it's going to be all Honduras. And all the same price. That will be expected to ship in August or September. So each blend is limited to 2,000 boxes of 10 cigars. So four Year of the Dragons from Gurkha. Is everybody in the industry <laughs> except Davidoff on the Year of the Dragon? No, well, like Davidoff it, is, but Davidoff just—I no, I just—I'm—I'm I'm saying like, right. holy fuck, man! Uh, is this going to be like a new thing that every single year we're going to see? Uh, you know, a every brand something. do a year of whatever uh, a Chinese calendar animal it is that year. So a bunch of them have been doing this already. That's why the trademark thing was just such kind of nonsense to me. Like, obviously, you know. We talked with Max about this, and I know a lot of that conversation was off air, so I understand it a lot better. But, yeah, like, I don't know. To to me, the one true Zodiac calendar that I'm going to go, or Chinese New Year calendar, whatever you want, Lunar New Year, that I will make sure I try to try every year is still going to be the Davidoff. Well, just to put in perspective. Agree. Just to put it in perspective, with Gurkha, you also have Asylum, Davidoff, Drew Estate, El Septimo, General, Habanos SA, JM Tobacco, La Galera, Oliva, Maya Savella, Placencia, uh, Rocky Patel, United Cigars, and Vega Fina all have Year of the Dragon themed cigars. Oh, so everybody did. You get a Year of the Dragon. You get a Year of the Dragon. You get a Year. Davidoff, fuck you. And yeah. Davidoff said, fuck you too. <laughs> Not. Uh, but. Right. That's fucking weird, man. I actually, though, I am looking forward to trying the Rocky one. Can't wait for that one. They're in our possession. I know. Got them. We got to actually at one point sit down and like go through all of the PCA shit and set up a schedule. I got a list of stuff that I got a list. Yay, Caleb! That's our recording secretary <laughs> right there, boys. All right. Final story. We have a tequila story out of Mexico. So we have uh, Mexican authorities have raided the home of a tequila matchmaker founders, and they are the ones who are going to all these tequila agave factories, and they want to do uh, a sticker on all these like bottles that say this is an unadulterated tequila factory. Uh, no arrests were made, but hundreds of glass bottles, jars, and assorted packagings have been seized. So Mexican authorities are saying this is a scam to get this label on the bottles to steal money from the companies. Apparently, the people that were running this were multimillionaires and they're living in this grand Mexican estate. So they wanted to say that all these bottles were additive free, uh, part of an additive free alliance. And you can already see some of these stickers on some bottles such as uh, Florencia and Cazines. If I'm saying it wrong, my bad. I don't, I don't drink a tequila. lot of tequila. Uh, but so... Uh, the Mexican authorities say we consider this a scheme offering in the market to certify or verify or confirm in any language that a certain trademark is additives free. So, so this is actually a big deal. So, uh, so people who love tequila, this is like a big thing. Like, I don't remember if you remember the conversation when we had with our boy Willie and he was like, got to make sure you get the additive free true agave. Well, sounds like a fuck ton isn't true agave. <laughs> Well, they already have a uh, organization. It's called the Consenso Regular del Tobacco AC. Tequila AC, sorry. Getting my tobacco and tequila mixed up. Uh -huh. So they already have a regulatory system for that. So they're saying this other one, which is Tequila Matchmaker, is kind of a scam. So That's what, that's what Mexican authorities are claiming. But so you, it's pay for play. You just buy this sticker and then like, oh, yeah, it's added or free. So a lot of this shit would used to be very pro or, uh, prominent in like the supplement industry. Like, yeah, uh, banned the substance free, and then suddenly, like, NCAA football players were like, what the fuck? I just lost a year of my senior year? <laughs> For taking Jack 3D. Yeah. Or C4. Oh, geez, man. Yeah, yeah, that was back in the day. Ooh, R.I.P. 
Miss him. All right, that will conclude the News of Kale segment. So now we have to rate our cigar. So what'd you come up with there, Mr. Steen? Let me pull it up. I'm all done. So we did the Clovis appearance with that nice barber pole and the candela in there. I'm giving it a nine. Cool as always. Uh, burn. This thing burned evenly. Just one light. No issues there. Gave it a nine as well. Construction. I gave it a nine. Uh, great stack of dimes. Really held up. Very heavy cigar. Like it was a tank. You probably could have dropped it. Thing still would have kept smoking. Uh, draw. I did a straight cut. Had no issues as well. Gave it a nine. Enjoyment. Gave it a nine and a half. We had Skip Martin on himself. So overall score ninety one for me. So forty five and a half. Uh, additional notes on this. Very heavy. On the leather, especially on the cold draw and throughout smoking it. A little bit of peppery spice in there as well. I thought, so here's where the cigar really changed for me. I thought at the halfway point, it mellowed out a little bit. But then I got to that final third and this thing got heavy. It really hit you. So I kinda, I'm kind of in that mood where I needed to grab a chocolate because I'm like, yeah, it's it's hitting out. And it's weird because at the halfway point, I really thought it mellowed out. And I was Caleb like, was throwing around the Twix bars in the middle of the fucking <laughs> yeah. show. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I thought it mellowed out, but boy, did it change up and it got uh, spicy and heavy at the end. So, uh, 91, great cigar, man. Uh, Roma Craft Clovis. Uh, the appearance, I gave it a nine. I really like how the cigar looks. Uh, pretty standard as far as the black Irish would be. They just kind of change it up from a broadleaf to a Pennsylvania. Uh, the burn, I gave it a nine. This thing is absolutely perfect. I never touched this thing up one time from the moment I started smoking it till now. Uh, I straight cut it as well. Uh, I feel like that's important. What'd you do, Caleb? Straight cut as well. Straight cut. Construction, I gave it a 10. I don't say this often, but this thing absolutely would not have ashed if you don't make it ash. Uh, This thing is... It's crazy constructed. Uh, the draw, 9.5, very smoky cigar. I don't know if you guys noticed when we were like kind of, you know, in those like midpoints where it was a little easier to take draws and you weren't nubbing it like I was, fingertip and thumb. Uh, really, really, really good draw. Uh, enjoyment, I gave it a 9, bringing me to a 46.593 overall. Uh, like Skip said, I think that the cigar, despite having great flavors, with a little bit of time for it to mellow out, is going to be an absolute bomb. Caleb touched on the strength of the cigar. This thing is very strong. Uh, he said this thing is less strong than the Black Irish, which, I mean, like I said, uh, I'm not a guy who smokes 10 a day to make sure that they're, uh, I'm not doing the quality control of the cigar. Uh, I will go and I will, you know, I'll smoke a Black Irish. I'll really enjoy it. But, you know, come to think of it, I never really smoked another Black Irish back to back. Uh, that midpoint Caleb touched on, it really does, in my opinion, is the pepper on it in the, uh, I don't know, it just feels like it mellows out a little bit. That's what I thought. But the <laughs> strength kicks up, uh, and this thing just kind of melts you into a chair. Uh, if I, that's what you're chasing and you like that full, full, full body cigar, this is right up your alley. Uh, this is a cigar that I particularly do go after i like a cigar that puts me in my ass i'm looking forward to what you guys thought so i want to touch on that part of things like we have to be a little conscious too like we are smoking this before anyone else before it goes to market so our experience is probably going to be a little bit different than the general public um there is a chance that that strength mellows out as they get to sit a little uh that said i think we were all similar in the experience because i was good through i was like oh wow then suddenly like oh hello (laughs) that final third is where it really kicks up i'm interested to see and smoke another one where they hit the general public on really how when skip's comfortable of them being on a retail shelf how they actually you know uh i got tongue-tied there taste uh, so I'll get into my review here. Appearance, I gave this thing a nine. Really nice shade. The candela, like barber pole style, brings out a lot of little pop to it. I'm interested to see how the boxes look. You know, if it's you know a real cool logo or something of those things, like might be able to push it up half a point. I'm one of those little suckers for a nice box. Yeah, you know what I did there. Mm. <laughs> but uh, burn, nice. I gave this thing a nine. Uh, for this being a broadleaf, obviously, again, like I'm really trying to focus on essentially grading broadleaf on a curve. I didn't have to touch this thing up very often. I was very impressed with that. Like, so 
I'm very curious again how you know these age in that regard if that gets even better. Uh, construction. This is where I might differ you a little bit, Jerry. I was wearing a lot of ash from this one. Really? Yeah. Like I'm just like Ugh. I think the fucking laptop had some. I'm like eh, fuck. So I gave it an eight. How point. am I able to keep it together, dog? I'm not a finesse guy. We've had this conversation before. I know, just like doing anything athletic. You know, not your. Not it your depends forte. on the type of athletic. Because guess what? I could still fucking power clean, which requires an incredible amount of athleticism. But I'm a power guy. I'll, I'll get it. Tell me about your jerk. I'll show you a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> clean and jerk. But uh, now I'll go to draw. This is where I think we were uh, similar. So you straight cut. You said Jerry, right? I did. Caleb, what'd you go with? Straight as well. Okay, I punched. I loved the the draw on this thing with a punch. It was that the little bit uh, thicker ring gauge that really brought out the uh, the ideal nature for a punch. That's like just for me. I enjoyed that, and I've obviously been on that kick a lot lately. And I think the uh, variety between the three of us of cuts is you know important too because everyone has their own preference. Uh, so draw that was a 9.5 enjoyment i gave that a 9.5 as well really enjoyed the conversation with skip you know guy that we've definitely gotten to know a lot more you know since this has got going and the relationship's very good with them and just the banter's fun like obviously talking more about what's in the future for roma craft and just the general industry guys a wealth of knowledge I appreciate that. I gave it a 9.5. That brought my total score to a 45.5, bringing me to a 91. Mm, Another 91. How do we do, Caleb? All right, let me just do the math. Should be easy. Don't know why I need to bring the math out for this, but uh, let me see what we got here. 93, 91, 91. 91.66. Round that up to 92. (laughs) Great stick, man. Great stick. And uh, for those looking for this exact blend, if you guys are curious to try it, obviously uh, Skip did mention that it might not be out for a little while. Uh, check out that EMH Cro-Magnon Pennsylvania Broadleaf. Uh, those are out. Those are probably at your local brick and mortars that carry Rome Craft right now. Make sure you guys are checking those out because uh, I think this is a blend that you guys are actually really going to like. Yeah, we smoked the shorts, or you guys smoked the shorts at the show. Uh, I haven't, I got mine saved. I'm one of those people that really, I feel like I didn't get to smoke nearly as many cigars at PCA this year. That cameraman syndrome. <laughs> I don't know, man. I was just chiefing the whole weekend. I loved yeah. it. I smoked over Jer- Jerry, you're like, yes, I get to sit. Hey, wait, wait. Move it just a little. All right, back. <laughs> of course, I still had my critiques. Then you're just chilling in the corner. Oh my god, your Roma Craft interview was atrocious. The hand, the handheld, dude, it was atrocious. Awful. It's all right, buddy. You were you were the uh, video cuck of the show. <laughs> you just sat there in it's the corner. Nice and watched. to watch. <laughs> a nice little plug, guys. Make sure you're following the after her for those uh, PCA interviews we did. Uh, check that out. On you know, Patreon. I gotta say, those have been a pretty big hit for uh, like you know the enjoyment. I see everyone who's on the Patreon seems to like them. The clips that we've posted have gotten. Some love, even, you know, some of the weirder ones. Listening to Caleb with fucking Neil Garcia, Jake Wyatt, <laughs> was probably one of the most... Even watching it, you feel uncomfortable. I gotta say, I cannot believe they reposted that. <laughs> but thank you, Jake Wyatt and Neil. We appreciate you guys. <laughs> hey, we'll have them on. We'll have them back for a real serious interview. That being said, Caleb, any closing notes of the episode? I already mentioned the After Herf on the Patreon. Go ahead and follow that, guys. Uh, make sure you're checking out the Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, most importantly. Got to follow. Got to get those subscribers up. Grower Gang, thank you guys all. And uh, make sure you tune in every Wednesday with us. You know, always new episodes. Absolutely. And that being said, if you're listening to us audio only, make sure you're checking that out on the Cigar Hustler Podcast Network, the number one cigar network on Podbean. That, those are our boys. They're putting out bangers. Uh, I just saw that they did an interview with Guy Fury. Uh, make sure you guys check that out. That was pretty cool. Uh, I definitely got a text from Mikey in the middle of that. Like, hey, where are you guys at? But we were definitely in the middle of an interview. So Damn, uh, we, we probably, out. you know, we, we probably could have been over there doing our thing with them guys. But, uh, you know, the, the future's bright. And, you know, I, I'm sure it'll come eventually. Uh, that being said, guys, make sure you're checking us out. And uh, all the cool stuff that we do. Geo, do you have anything? 
No, I'm good. I'm ready. You know, I mean, you guys touched on everything. Guys, keep liking and subscribing. We appreciate it. You know, I feel like the Instagram, for whatever this week, suddenly everything decided to let my notifications haven't stopped. Uh, another, we love that. Another, Not, no complaints. Another thing I do want to touch on, we are getting ready to do our uh, biannual mega giveaway. Yeah. I mean, here's another thing that none of us touched on, you know. This essentially, when this airs next week, this will be our two-year anniversary episode, basically. This is our two-year anniversary yeah. episode. So that get we'll, we are we'll, past our two-year anniversary. Right, it was the second. Was that when our first episode aired? Guys, appreciate you. Two years of dealing with our fucking nonsense and how much we've grown. You know, we love you and thank you for making this all possible. That being said, we'll see you guys next Wednesday. Peace. We'll